Yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk, man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. That's right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. And that's the bottom line. Just stone go set up. If you're gonna blitz, come strong, but don't come at all. Coming strong with another edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns 247com I am Jeff Howe. It's appropriate that uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin is a part of my intro. Decided to wear the wrestling shirt into the studio today. Suplex City. Rolling with the Brock Lesnar shirt today. I like it. Yeah. Nice. Had to go, Representing. Had, had to go get some blood drawn this morning. Had to get in the right frame of mind, Rod. <laughs> I hate. I hate. Are, are you doing more. that for charity? I'm assuming. No, no, no. It's doctor. Had to, you know. Is it right actually? Oh, you doing it for medical? Reasons. Yeah, they needed some doctors. I hear it needs you to go get this done. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you got to go down to the lab with your little form and whatnot. See, I told you. Told you last week. Anytime you're doing grown up stuff, you know there's a form involved. Yeah, there's a form, actual form, like not something you do online. Like right. they want, they want a, they want like, actual paper, like on a dot matrix out. printer. This is true. Print it out, and you had to take the form in with you. That's so, a good point. So to get the right frame of mind, because like drunk, giving blood for me, it's like a huge process. Like I've passed out like three or four times. You passed giving, out? Yeah, I don't know why. Like it wow. just really. It's just so happened. is it a yeah. mental thing, like a the that fainting, is crazy. or is it a physical Here, thing? Here's what thing happened. Sometime blood. Right. So I was a sophomore in high school. And it was during a football practice. I was having like some chest pains. They took me to the hospital. It turns out I was severely dehydrated. Yeah, mm. it happens in Texas. And I had to get Everybody's stuck. Really been there. My mom counted, I think, 11 or 12 times. They had to stick me before they finally found a vein. And ever since then, it's just been like just this mental. Oh, uh, I think yeah. I think that's right. I, I go to get blood. I go to mm-hmm. get blood. I'm like Shaq at the free throw line. It's just all up yeah. here, and I I just psych myself out. Oh, that's all right. So. It's probably I'm sure there's a phobia, like a technical phobia Maybe. for that. Maybe. I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, she go talk to someone. I probably should. She go talk to like a therapist or something. No, I'm sit, serious. Sit on the couch. No, you should. It would help. It would open that. It would. It would break. All I found out that barrier. if I just if I hide if I know I'm giving blood if I hydrate the night before. And then ha. usually like chug a Gatorade on my way there. So you didn't pass and out. You la- are and then, uh, and then la- trypanophobic. And then lay down. If Boom. I lay down there when they go. get blood, I'm fine. So you. I just take precautions. Ah, up to 10% of society is trypanophobic. There you go. Mm. See? There you go, man. Interesting. Get treated for your trypanophobia. <laughs> I'll, I'll put that on my to-do <laughs> list this summer. Trypan. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we're going to talk Longhorn football. That was, really interesting. Term. That was very interesting. I've, I've never loved that about See, you. I've been you learned, you for a long time. You learn something on Longhorn Blitz All every time. week. Uh, mm-hmm. We're going to learn about the Longhorn football, though. We're going to do that and uh, right. wherever this adventure of adventure of Longhorn Blitz takes us. You never know. Um, let's go. Let me go ahead and introduce the rest of the team. He's the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, the man behind the glass, Matt Butler. And Matt, Matt, I want you, uh, if Travis, our videographer, the best damn videographer in the podcast game, Ooh, if Travis can true. zero in on you, Matt, will you hold up your, your fantasy baseball charts? Because this is... Matt's like Russell Crowe, beautiful mind. Yeah, back bring there up some with his numbers. Daily fantasy. All right, these are the pictures for today. Yeah, just so you got over here. First off, you got shades of green. Exit and velocity. Pinks. Yellow means very good. That means they don't hit it hard. Pink oh, means very very fantasy bad. Fo- fantasy basketball stuff. Uh, baseball. Going to baseball, baseball now. Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So a lot of exit velocities, uh, batted ball distances, and then fly ball rates, ground ball rates, things of that sort. Stuff going way over my head. Yeah, see, that's yeah, man. I I, I can't even. Muchos keep up numeros. With you. It's like hieroglyphics to me. That what you're talking about. Yeah, and basically on so. paper, these numbers say Astros pitcher Lance McCullers is quite comparable to Clayton Kershaw. So that's pretty cool. See, if if this were like oh, money, if this were like that is actually interesting. Now that I could use. If there this, you go. It's, it, that is stuff yeah. I could use right there. If, you this, know what I mean? if this were Moneyball, Matt would be like the Paul De Podesta characters with their spreadsheets and their flow charts and whatnot. I'd just be like the old school scout. Like, yeah, nah, that's give, true. Give, me yeah. The give it test. to me. Give it to me. Oh, he's comparable to the Clayton Kershaw. Boom. Thank you. That's and all the, I need. The data behind <laughs> it, batted ball, they both uh, exit velocity off of balls hit it 88 miles an hour, yet McCullers, people hit the ball shorter than they do off of Kershaw, a full nine feet shorter. And when you add on to that, McCullers throws more than a mile an hour harder per pitch. So people are hitting it less distance, and he throws harder, and they hit it in there less. So Astros, that's damn good. Astros need another start, but right now they're the best team in Major League Baseball, and honestly, there's some distance between them yes. and the rest of the league. Yes, that's, folks, that's how crazy it is. That yeah. statistical analysis, that's why folks like the Longhorn Network have employed Matt Butler to Hell do stats yeah. in the past. He's a, yeah. He's a, yeah, he's like a beautiful mind when it comes to it the really sports is. stats. It's kind of weird. Yeah, like Matt's – It I'm, is weird. I've been in a 
press, a football press box with Matt when he's Matt. You've done stats work for IMG, right? Yep. Um, Mr. Craig Way for, for he, Matt's been Craig Way stat. If you're Craig Way stat guy, yeah, that's, that's all I need to say. You know, true. you're good. I so agree with that. appreciate the, all that's Matt does for the show. Yeah. Um, I, he hadn't been Craig Way stat guy, but he has been Craig Way's co-host. That's why he's a Renaissance man of this Another show. Stat guy, I'm not smart enough for been that. Been his analyst. Yes, I don't add up that well. Sideline reporter extraordinaire, lifetime Longhorn, 2002 UT All American, 2002 semifinalist. For the Jim Thorpe Award, fourth round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 2003, spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFL. When he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas, under 40 acres where he earned his degree. He wears his T ring proudly, and he is a card carrying member of DBU. Number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. Thanks for the intro, brother. And Rod, I, I kind of spoke out of turn last week on the show. I said uh, commencement was going on down on the 40. Last weekend, it's actually this weekend. Finals okay. were going on last week, so nice. commencement is this weekend. That's Michael Griffin, Corey Redding. T.J. Ford is graduating. Give it up for T.J. Ford. Man, T.J. Ford T.J. Ford. That's a beautiful thing. Got that thing. lengthy NBA career, got he, his number in the Rafters, and now he's got his degree. He, on he basically just kind of got around to graduate, and he's been doing things in the community, doing right. things with like his foundation and stuff for a while. I think he was coaching for a little bit. He's uh, tried a lot of different things. I think now that he's settled, he decided to go back. So congrats to him and to my man C-Red, who, you know, C Red played forever. I think C Red uh, finally has kind of figured out, like, hey man, he's done. He was done for like three straight years. He was telling me, oh man, every time I talk to him, every obviously he's like, you know what? This is it for me, bro. Right. I think I'm done. And he wasn't done. And I think finally he got done with the game. So I'm glad he's back to it. I'm glad all the guys graduated. Corey Redding and Mark Henry both. Yeah. Just and just like Mark with wrestling. Mark day, Henry's the same way. One day it's she's just be like, Yeah, I'm done. Really? Three, uh, like three or four years, Mark Henry's been talking about retirement, but he hasn't yet. Still beloved. Uh, so, yeah, he's kind of the Corey Redding of WWE. And, yeah, it's a really good – I like that comparison there. Uh, and congrats to Michael Griffin, too, who's a member of DBU like myself. So there's not a lot going on right now. Uh, I said this last week, and we ended up going down a rabbit hole with conference realignment and all kinds of different stuff. You can um, do that. But really, not a lot going on. You got baseball pretty much. I mean, golf is in the NCAA tournament. They, they're hosting the regional. Um, baseball, softball is in the regional. That's pretty much it right now going down on the 40. Uh, Matt, one interesting thing that I want to uh, I wanted to bring up, you talked about exit velocity. Yes. So in the press box, they track exit velocity for, for the Longhorns. Oh, they do. Uh, Pat, I haven't seen that in college. Patrick Mathis had an opposite field home run in the 10-3 win over Incarnate Ward Tuesday night. Exit speed of 103. Very good. Mm, okay. That's some Stanton ass. I didn't numbers. need to know what the exit speed was to know that he mashed it. Like yeah. it was one of those once it once it connected with the barrel, you knew it was a matter of where it was gonna land. I didn't know if it was gonna clear the scoreboard, the new tennis center over there or what, <laughs> but yeah, he he got a hold of it. Uh baseball team, by the way, huge series this weekend against West Virginia, and then the Big Twelve tournament coming up next week, and then likely with the way things sit right now, uh an NCAA tournament bid for the Longhorns looking very likely. Uh, Matt, I've, I've figured this out. And, guys, this is just how you know things have been what they've been on the 40. This uh, if, when, if Texas makes the NCAA tournament, which right now I looked at the latest projections, uh, Baseball America has Texas projected as a number two seed in the Louisville Regional. Um, Texas is also, uh, I believe, D1Baseball.com has Texas as a three seed in the Fayetteville Regional. Uh, Matt, this would only be the second time in the last six years Texas has made the NCAA tournament as an at-large team. Yeah, that's sort of – so. I mean, being Texas, Texas fans got so used to not only having the regional host, but then to be the super regional host where you get one of those top eight national seeds. And right now, Texas is just fighting to get in. And you look at the recent years, it's weird when you're going to, say, like Dallas Baptist and going to these second-level parks. But whenever that does happen, it also shows that you can be that low seed that can carry – because you always see that low seed, the traditional power in college baseball. A couple of those can carry through and win a regional. So sometimes it sets up well where you don't have to be, say, stuck with, you know, a top end one seed. You get one of those, say, bottom end one seeds and get a higher two seed, though, that you got to fight through early in that regional. Texas was, uh, I believe Texas was the two seed in the Rice Regional a couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, when we took on A&M. Yeah. Or maybe it was a three in A&M. Were they but a I think Texas might have been in a three might that a three. year. Okay. Yeah. Then, uh, then there were the three. I don't remember. It's not in front of me. So I'll take your word for it, Matt. Um, Could anyways, be wrong, so, too. So baseball is winding down. I see some people. By the way, we are on Facebook Live at the Horns247.com Facebook page. Um, 
So he's asking about basketball. Not a whole lot going on basketball. Not a whole lot going on with team football right now because we mentioned commencement. The semester's over. Guys on the football team are pretty much – they've gone home or they're working out on their own. Mm-hmm. Weight room renovations going down on the 40. That should be done by June 1st by the time the players get back in. That locker room, the locker room should be done. Uh, Texas is going to have – I don't remember the exact date of it, but they're going to have a, a Friday Night Lights camp in July. So by the time the recruits come back, should be done. that should be done. Yeah. So a lot of stuff going on in Moncrief right now, but just nothing really brewing as far as the team goes. The basketball team – same thing. Everybody's waiting to see what Mom and Bamba does. The five-star power forward from New York hasn't made a decision yet. It's down to Texas and Kentucky. If Texas gets Mo Bamba uh, and Andrew Jones comes back, you could be looking at a team that might have the pieces, depending on what you get from Matt Coleman at point guard, to make a run at the Sweet 16. If you don't get Mo Bamba and Andrew Jones stays in the draft, you could be looking at another season where you're on the outside looking at a tournament. Person. Sounds like the uh, Bizarro World version of Black Mamba. Mabamba? <laughs> yes, is it, is it Mo Mo, that Mo, it's Mo. It, his first name is Muhammad, but it's Mo. He goes by Mo. Mo Bamba. Mo Bamba. That's what they call it, Mo Bamba. Yeah. Like, like separately, though. Bamba not, not is like his last just, name. Not like, not like meshed together as one word. Like right. Mo Bamba. Yes, Bamba. Not Mo Bamba. Bamba is his last name. Yes. Okay, there you go. But I'm so sure, if, sure if Mo Bamba ends up at Texas, Texas fans will have fun with it and whatnot. I so. like that name. That's nice. Rolls off the tongue. Mo right. Bamba. Uh, anything you guys want to touch on before I get into the big topic this week? Well, uh, since you brought up basketball, uh, just I was a bit surprised. Now you knew that you had the new rules where players can work out for the draft, and everybody's right. seeing Jared Allen, of course, a guy that's yeah. smart to leave. But seeing Andrew Jones work out for the draft was actually—I mean, it's not surprising when you think about it. I just hadn't even thought about it until that happened, and then you hear that he had been impressive. So that's at least worth following. There is something because that could have a big factor on how good Texas is next year. If again you're trying to find a good guard. Absolutely. Uh, Robbie, Robbie, you got anything you need to hit on? Any any, um, any housekeeping items you need to uh, – No, not really. No, get out of the way. Not much going on. Before no. we get rolling. No, let's get rolling. All right. So the big topic I got this week is uh, – hang on just a sec. I just want to make sure Facebook Live is, is good. I just, <laughs> I just like to keep the Facebook Live up just to make sure we're not missing I saw any a questions. funny uh, – we try, we try to answer as you know questions when we get them. Um, but anyway, go ahead, Matt. Sorry. Well, the first one was funny from our Facebook live feed. He's like, where's the damn closed captioning? It was like, uh, that'd be nice to have it live. But unfortunately, <laughs> we can't close caption as we go. That'd be a hell of a court transcription in there. Right, right man. You got to blame uh, yeah, blame Zuckerberg. You can get that done. Yes. Yes. Write a code. Zuckerberg. Yeah, we well, already get listening that. to our phones, so do yeah. it. So, Rod, I just wanted to bring this up. I want to let you guys just kind of bounce it off each other, and we bounce it off the three of us, whatever. So... I just started looking at the money Texas is spending. I just mentioned the locker room renovations, mm-hmm. weight room renovations, Moncrief getting a little facelift. $10 million going into this project that's going to be done, for sure be done by the time the team gets back and reconvenes for fall camp in August. Yeah. But you got that going on. You've got the salaries of the assistant coaches approved by the Board of Regents this week, if I can talk, approved by the Board of Regents. Uh, Todd Orlando is the first Texas coordinator to cross the $1 million $1 market dollars. annual salary. Big time. Um, and you've also got – there was something else that uh, I wanted to uh, – it but was, just held the support staff too, and and that was the other thing. Yes, thank support you, Rod. Staff, I've got it right in front of me, and I can't like yeah. read my own typeface. It's annoying. Support staff. Is, uh, what is it now? It's the it's the second largest in the country. That's only crazy. only I Notre know. Dame has a larger well, support think staff. Fast that than Texas. Yeah, we were just talking about them behind the times. That happened what in two three months. So you yeah. got facilities, money going into facilities, money going into assistant coaches contracts, money going into support staff. Yeah. And I thought about this analogy when, and, and this will be, I'm, I'm doing a column on this at Hornets247.com right now. It'll be part of my three things I think, three things I know column. And one of the, the thing that came to me as, as I'm thinking about this and Texas spending all this money, it's coincidence I'm wearing the shirt. I started thinking about WWE and I started thinking about it from this standpoint. Hmm. You guys know part of the reason I'm a pro wrestling fan is the backstory just fascinated me. The behind the scenes stuff is fascinating yeah. to me. And you hear guys that work closely with Vince McMahon talk about when he, because just to give you a quick history lesson, his father owned the company before him. Vince bought it. And the goal was to turn it from a regional promotion in the Northeast into the global empire it has become today. That was his vision. And while seeing that vision play out, his philosophy was always invest money back into the product. 
Mm-hmm. So while wrestling promoters for years and years were busy kind of counting their cash on the side and being content with it, no, I'm going to – Vince McMahon's idea was I'm going to invest it in television production. I'm going to invest it to make sure I've got the highest paid ring crews. I've got the best office staff. I've got yeah. the best guys that can work in post-production. I've got the best cameramen. I've got the best announcers. You know, our catering for our guys is going to be the best back. So mm-hmm. whatever, it is, whatever it is, always invest money back into your, pro- into your product. And look at where WWE is now. It is a global phenomenon. It is a it is a giant in the entertainment industry. And I started thinking about about Texas. And Rod, one thing that you said you said this several years ago, it was right around the time Baylor was getting ready to build McLean Stadium and TCU was renovating all their facilities. We turned all these Big Twelve schools, Boone Pickens, had just given Oklahoma State a bunch of money for their facilities. And while Texas was bragging about being the Joneses. Whether it was ignorance or arrogance, nobody wanted to admit that the Johnsons were moving a little further up the block yeah, and had houses that were just as nice, if not nicer, than what the Joneses had. Yeah. And I think Tom Herman has provided the slap in the face that everybody on the 40 needed to realize you have slipped into a state, Texas, where your facilities and pretty much everything you're doing is second rate. It's been great to brag about Texas having all this revenue and in terms of your revenues compared to everybody else in college football, you're one of the highest grossing programs, if not the highest grossing program. That's great. But are you investing that money back into your product? And for many, many years, it's been the case where Texas has it. And now to see Texas start to invest money back in the product, putting it into facilities, putting it into assistant coaches' salaries, mm-hmm. putting it into support staff. The South End Zone project is going to get done at some point. I think you're going to see a new practice facility at some point. And Tom Herman's mentality is you should always have some sort of project going on, some sort of facilities project yeah. should always be going on under your watch. If that's the case, Rod, then I think that's something Texas fans can feel good about knowing that that old era of Texas athletics where – it almost does come off. It does not almost. It does come off as arrogance that, yeah, we're Texas and we make a lot of money. That's great. But what are you doing with that money? You're seeing Texas invested into the product. And I think you're going to see that translate into facilities can help you get recruits, which is going to help you win ball games, which is going to help everybody's bottom line. Um, and, you know, when you when you write your piece, make sure that you uh, clarify that the brand is, was still even while this is going on was still lucrative and still powerful, still profitable. It was still the the, the, the largest uh, revenue generating brand in college football, even during those those times where they were ignoring um, keeping up with the rest of the Big 12 and even the rest of college football. And another thing to note is, you know, we talked about the sense of entitlement with the players and the sense of entitlement with, you know, the latter end of Coach Brown's tenure and how, you know, that that entitlement was kind of toxic and led to kind of a cancer all throughout the program. Well, that also is reflected in the facilities. You know, there's a sense of entitlement in the bubble that Texas, oh, is, we're, we're Texas. What are you talking about? Nah, what are you talking about? We ain't got the best. We got right. the best. I mean, I don't need to go see. I don't need to see what TCU's got going on or what, you know, Baylor's got going on or Oklahoma. We got the best. We're the best. And, you know, in this era of kind of fake news where you can, mm-hmm. uh, where you can, you know, kind of make up your own facts and propaganda and have a certain, you know, constituency, loyal constituency that will believe it, you know, that, you know, Longwood fans are guilty of that too. Yeah. You know, and for a long time, you know, we kind of believed that. And it was masked too by also, you know, two of the greatest back to back quarterbacks in the history of college football. I don't know if there actually has been two better back to back quarterbacks in the history of college football. That actually ended up, you know, uh, helping the, uh, the, the guys and helping the, I would say, the illusion. That oh no no it's all good it's all good everything's well, great everything's great you know what I mean the the house looked great on the outside but the foundation was crumbling a little bit and inside the house things were you know kind of going crazy exactly. and yeah the 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 roof needed fixing but nobody saw that either and the ceiling was all messed up you know what I mean and the plumbing was all screwed up but from the outside it looked really really good and it's old money and old money it's hard to get rid of old money oh that's Texas old money and that there's no and it's like the the Cowboys or the Steelers Steelers or the Giants or, you know, there are some brands, the Yankees, they are just old money. It don't matter if they are bad in terms of win or loss uh, in terms of their actual product. The brand is still that 
uh, transcendent. It's still that powerful. I think that actually is a positive. Yeah, because coming it out of the recent years, those you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's something also to note in your piece. The brand, it's amazing, like how. You know, what I mean, how, pers- how how it persevered through that, and it still was able to be very lucrative. So that shows you that, man, could you imagine if somebody dusts off the brand and brings it back into the 21st century, what it could possibly become with right. L.A. Chan and its own network? So I think when we, uh, you know, explore that, how he's kind of bringing us from this antiquated time, which I agree he is, kind of a modern-day Mac Brown, which we all think that he is. He has those those traits, too. Um, also note that, man, through that time period, the sense of entitlement also is reflected in that. But, man, the brand has persevered and still is it still is something that's very attractive. Like, it's a, it's amazing. Like, that's how powerful that brand is. We have been a terrible football program for the last, well, like, that's... six years. But that kids still love that brand. That brand, all you got to do is shine it up a little bit. Tom Herman just shined it up a little bit. He ain't done nothing. He ain't won no games. He just came, brought right. his swagger here, shined it up, put out some tweets, uh, brought in a couple of big names from wrestlers, Matthew McConaughey, and everybody's like, damn, man, that brand's starting to look good. That's, you know, I mean, I think that's the power of it. The, the, the brand can, and even with Charlie Strong, the brand was down, but he was still recruiting well. You know what I mean? Like, that's the power of the brand. The brand is always going to be okay. The brand will persevere. Yeah. We just got to make sure that the product matches the brand. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's really Like being... the Dallas Cowboys. The, brand, the Cowboys brand has always been fine. Mm-hmm. Cowboys fan, as Jeff knows, you got to make sure the product matches the brand, and that's what's happening now. Hell, for you know, what I mean, those two visions have not always been yes, aligned. But but Jerry Jones made sure the product, um, you know, what I mean, sometimes the product would suffer because he was so worried about the brand. But you know, what I mean, you're still all right. Yeah, that's and when you have the brand and that lasting power to afford you the luxuries that you can survive those situations, like, say, a recent area where you aren't successful, other programs may plummet and not be able to gain that momentum back. And that's why when you brought up the image is the big thing there, right? Because you think about, you know, what was selling all the merchant, all the things to give the illusion that everything was okay. Oh, well, they're still making more money, still selling more. But that's because it's the outside world. It's everybody on the outside buying things, but not actually being there. And like you were saying, not actually seeing the house crumbling or not actually knowing that you're getting out of touch in-house and then when you end up having the image the public perception be molded oh it's texas it's power it's good we're gonna sell merchandise they're making money they're fine they're fine just assuming Mm -hmm. along those lines that fosters that entitlement inside of it until you realize hey we aren't cool anymore and you're looking around and having to redo everything so it's sort of a rebranding as you say to the modernization of texas where texas had been i mean when you are old money You have old ways, but then you quickly have to jump out of those ways. And you see big school or big brands across the world, like say Nike will have some controversy, but it has such long lasting power that it can overcome those little things, shift around and find your little spot with the modern society. And that's where Tom Herman sort of gets those gaps together, gets that old in with the new, and then right now gives you a shot to be become relevant with the new, because that's just going to buy you 50 more years of cool if you can get in again with that next generation. Texas has always had a next generation thing when you look every decade or two, get very successful. You've never been able to have a long-standing lull that drops you down to irrelevancy. You see some powers, some teams, some schools, that happens. Yeah. Just Texas hasn't went there yet. Yeah. I think Texas is is in that rare group with, uh, you know, Ohio State, uh, Michigan, Southern Cal, those select few schools, Notre Dame, where I think the brand will always be a powerful brand yeah. because of the name. The difference here is Tom Herman is doing what hasn't been done at Texas in a long time. He's maximizing the brand. For so long, it was, ah, we're Texas. We can get fine. Tom Herman's like, yeah, we're Texas, but we can be better than just being Texas. We can take we can take Texas and make it so much more than what it is and maximize this brand and get the most out of it. I, I think he is doing it on a different scale. I don't know if he's the first because Mac Brown did the same thing. When Mac right, Brown came right, in, Mac right. Brown was like, hey man, we gotta do these facilities. We got we gotta get them up. We right. gotta get away from Reebok. We gotta get to Nike. Like he had his plan, he had his vision, and he knew I need the big money to help me do this thing. Right. And you know, I got friends that are boosters and donors, and yeah, they are saying that on a unprecedented in his scale, Tom Herman is given the blank check, and he's like, "Hey, I need it. Can I? I got. I gotta have it. 
All right, I got to have it. I got to have it. And I think that that is the right approach while you right now have all the credit. Like, you have all the he, points. He, unless have, he wins yeah, a national the championship, he will never have more leverage. Yeah, you have right all now. the leverage right now, so this is the time to do it. So I think it's the right move for him. I think it's the right move for the program. It's dynamic. He's just bursting a lot of bubbles. Like, nothing wrong with that. So I don't know if he's, like, the first one to do it. I mean, people have done it. He's just doing it on an unprecedented scale. Yeah, he's done, he's not the first because the yeah, Texas I mean, brand it's it's comparable to where it was when Mac took over because yeah, the Texas Mac brand to do. nationally Texas had relevance because it's Texas and Texas was one yeah. of the TV darlings under Darrell Royal and, and had an all time great running back right yeah, people, Ricky people, people nationally knew the brand and they knew Texas as a superpower kind of a sleeping giant waiting to be woken up and Mac did that it's just at some point post national championship. Everybody just kind of got complacent, man. Yeah. And I will say this though: uh, Tom Herman, people are not going to be as Tom Herman is doing everything on an unprecedented scale, and he is has all the leverage, and, and he needs to be pushing the envelope. But there will be he he knows he knows this. He's very smart than I am. That there won't be as much patience for for him that there was for Mac Brown. Right. Like that was plenty because it was a different world, different mm -hmm. landscape, different, time, a different yeah. Big Twelve. Hell, yeah. when Mac came in, there wasn't even Bob Stoops yet. Bob Stoops, I, Mac Brown would have got a few more years of patience if not for Bob Stoops, right. who oh, yeah. came in and put the immediate pressure on Mac when he won a national title in his second year. And everybody was like, whoa, hey, <laughs> hey Mac, Mac. Again, well, the hey, Big 12 Mac, evolving ahead hey, of the rest hey, of college your, football. Your number one recruiting classes ain't enough no more, bro. You know what I mean? Like, it, it was just that simple. And then, the, and then the pressure started to mount for Mac. And luckily for Mac, he ended up being able to achieve that with Vince Young and those like 2002 classes and on and on. But my point being, I don't think Tom Herman's going to have that because we just live in a different time. Right. Uh, there is a different, it's a, it's a different Big 12, different Texas in terms of the region that he is competing in and the state of Texas. So, yeah, I think he's going to have like less patience to deal with it, but he's, I think he's inheriting probably less talent too than Mac there's inherited. A, Not a, probably, he is yeah, inheriting right. less talent than Mac inherited too. There's but a, there's, in a less competitive conference, right? At this scene, eh. I don't know. That 98 Big 12 wasn't great either. I think that may be yeah, comparable. K-State was a top K five State team. Was in, Nebraska yeah. was still really good. Nebraska was still good. Yeah. A&M was, really yeah. was the so, so no, I think, you're right. I think you're it right. may have been a better conference, too, than Mac Brown. Yeah, been, probably. I mean, and he ended up having more talent because McEvick had him loaded with first-round talent on that day. Casey team. Hampton and Quinn Jam Sean or... Rogers. Yeah, Quinn... Sean Rogers was the first-rounder, but Leonard no, Davis. Yeah, 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 Leonard Davis. Yeah, he was second round. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, my bad. Yeah, Second round pick. <laughs> yeah, loaded with guys. Okay. Anyway. Um, Brad, you, you, that's an interesting point you bring up. And internally, because I know you've talked to us in the past about you guys didn't really read the paper, listen to talk radio. There was no Twitter, no Different social world, media, man. not, not yeah. a big online presence back when you You can put us in the bubble. That offseason going from 2000 to 2001, we've talked about this offseason a lot, but how much did that internally accelerate the clock of – all right, it's not enough for us to win nine or ten games. We got to be in the Big 12 championship game. We got to win a national championship. How much did that Oklahoma national championship change things for Mac internally from your vantage point? Um, I think it changed everything. Yeah. I mean, I think the uh, – you know they have that. What is that? Um, that you know they have that uh, that clock, that clock, that doomsday clock or whatever it is, right? And the the the, the hand countdown. shifts, the countdown, depending on how close we are to like nuclear war. Oh, right. the DEFCON <laughs> levels, the, whatever. Well, it's not DEFCON. I think it's like a doomsday clock. They actually okay. do have one. They, they there's do. a doomsday clock, <laughs> and, and based on like the tensions within in the world, and you know how the United States is with the other superpowers, our relationship, you know, and who has nuclear weapons, the doomsday clock is ticking closer and closer to midnight, I believe. So I, I think for Mac Brown, when when Bob Stoops comes in and wins that national title in his second year, man, that doomsday clock, it, yeah. it went, it, I mean, it just, it instantly went close to right almost, I would say around 11.55. It was yeah, right think about Max Mine. He's like, man, we just got Ricky. We won a yeah. Heisman, you know, going to a bowl. We beat OU. And everybody loved it. And then, it. oh, my God, that it's just happened. Oh, you just yeah. won a championship. But did you, could you guys – Had that number one recruiting class. Could you guys feel that, though? Internally, oh, yeah, that was it. Was evident, it yeah. was evident that there's well, it, we, he didn't have to. I mean, we got beat 63 or whatever it was, 14, by that 14. Team. yeah. So we knew at that time, all right, you know, I mean, that the, the, the stakes the stakes have changed, everything's changed. All right, these guys want a national title and they went through us to do it. Not went through us, they steamrolled us on their way to winning a national title and everything changed. Speaking of Oklahoma yeah. and the rivalry, 
<laughs> one thing we, because this is another one that came out last week when we recorded. We didn't really get to react on it uh, because of the timing. But did you guys see Michelle Herman kind of yeah. responding to the uh, OU staff, throwing some shade? Yeah, the, the, Texas staff? Uh, the red Twitter rivalry, as I'm calling yeah, it. Yeah, you guys, <laughs> everybody who watches this or listen to it, you can kind of go. Yeah, do State your, Fair tweet fight. Do your research. But Rod, I, I like that. I like that there's some juice coming back into this rivalry and it's good. Look, it's going to take for it to be what it was during your day, which I was talking to my buddy, uh, who's a big OU fan. We're talking the other day and we're talking about, he called, cause he called me about this. He was like, what is OU staff talking about? And I kind of gave my two cents and, um, He's like, man, you know, when because but from the time we were in high school to my early college, he's like, man, we were spoiled during that rivalry. We was mm-hmm. pretty much a top five matchup every year, or every year. whoever wins that game is going to have an inside track of playing for the national championship. Like, we thing. were spoiled during that time. I was like, yeah, we, we pretty much were, but we both admitted you're ready for that rivalry to get back to that point because mm-hmm. that game in and of itself, in the last few years, where Oklahoma has been good but not what they were at one point under Bob Stoops. Texas has been where we've spent countless podcasts and I've used countless space online talking about where this program has been, but it's good. It's, it's good. Regardless, that game is always fun. It's my favorite thing of the sports calendar every year is Texas OU. But when there's something of great consequence on the line, a conference championship, a big 12 championship, that's the same deal, a national championship, something of consequence is going to be decided in that game. Yeah. Rod, you've been there for those games, man. That ups the ante of that game. You know, even when there's not a lot on the line, which I could say, you know, 99 the last, in Charlie, your freshman year, there really you know, in the wasn't. Charlie Strong years, there wasn't a, a ton on the line necessarily. No. Those games were still some damn good games. Yeah. And it ended up being weird, strange games. It was quick. But it was exactly games that Char- OU had no, be- no reason losing and they would lose. Exactly. Right. Those yeah. games was, meant the most to Charlie. Like, they didn't mean was, most to the rest of anybody. But it was like he was coaching for his career yeah, already it, that quickly at Texas. Every Texas OU and, game, it was a big win for the foundation of this program. And then, uh, you know, same way. I think we also learned, like, yeah, and, and I'm glad that, you know, Jeff brought up the significance and relevance of the game. I think are losing a lot of steam. I think that is reflective of the Big 12 just losing a lot of sex appeal. Big 12 has no cachet. Big 12 is losing respect. People don't mm-hmm. respect the conference anymore. The NFL has lost all respect for the Big 12 conference. I think that's part of the reason Deontay Foreman's draft stock dropped. I really That was my theory from the jump. I still believe it. Right. I think they, they just have no respect for the Big 12. They think people don't play defense in this conference. And I think that's part of why the – Texas Oklahoma rivalry is now where it is. I mean, the state of it, it's just not as sexy, even though for those of us who love it, you know, I, I still think it has that appeal. There, there isn't as much on the line. I think Tom Herman, because Texas hasn't been holding up its end of the bargain, let that be. I'm not throwing that, you know, I'm not forgetting that fact. And I think Tom Herman is here to bring that back. But also, like you said, now, you know, now you got a little bit of angst there. Now there's a little bit of competitive hatred coming back to it with, you know, Michelle Herman and her subtweet and the subtweet from the, you know, Oklahoma defensive backs coach. You know, I like it. I think it's, I think it's good. I think it's good for the rivalry. She, listen, she is, she is ride or die. Like I, and, and when, <laughs> when Tom cool. Herman first got the job, you know, people expected me to come on the buffet and rant about, you know, Tom Herman, how great he was. And I got a man crush on Tom Herman. My my the whole damn show is about Michelle Herman. Like she is legit. She's not here yet. I don't know. I don't think she's actually moved to I don't Austin think yet. So not mm. yet. When she comes, oh, she will make <laughs> her gonna presence be loud. Yeah. Yes. You will know she's here. Like she does not. She is legit, man. She's legit. There will there would be no Tom Herman if not for Michelle Herman. Right. She is she is bad. Like she is, and I'm telling you, she is. She will. She does not back down from anything. On social media, and Tom Herman, I got the feeling he don't tell her to back down either. Like he, he's right. like, I got other, I got bigger fish for. I ain't getting in that battle. You think I'm gonna get into a battle with that woman? Like, no, I, ain't, I think that's the only person that he backs down from is her. And I think she is, yeah, she, she's a Wolverine. She, she got into a, I, I know a lot of people in Houston, a lot of radio guys who got into it with her on social media and stuff. And they say, man, she does not mess around. Like, she's legit. Uh, so I, I, she's not here yet. I think people will feel her presence. But yeah, she's the ride or die. And I think that was just a little taste of it. She is the, I mean, she's the hottest first lady of football that Texas football has ever had. That is true. I'm, I'm, I think, uh, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think Edith Raw actually may be number two. <laughs> Edith Raw was, 
I mean, back in the day. You know what I mean? And then uh, Sally Brown maybe. Tweet your zone. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Sally Brown was really, trust me, Sally Brown was legit. You know, oh, yeah. Back in the day. She still is very attractive. But I don't know. I heard Edith Royal. Somebody told me, hey, man, don't forget about Edith Royal. You know what I mean? So what? I won't disrespect Edith Royal either. As a player, <laughs> but as a player under Mac, what was the Sally Brown dynamic for you guys? Just being her being around the facility, just kind of. I know oh, you have talked about Kate touch. Stutters talked about just she, yeah. just you know somebody you'd lean on for advice. Yeah, maybe you, you could go to Sally with problems you couldn't go to Mac with, et cetera, et cetera. She was definitely the uh, like the matriarch of the program and embraced the role. Like she was, it's almost like the. Uh, you know, and I always say this about Charlie Strong's wife. Like, one of the things, I don't think she embraced the role of being, like, the first lady of Texas football. Like, you should be around. Like, the, the, like at the Texas, and that's part of Charlie Strong. He didn't want to do that. But, like, Sally Brown at the women's, you know, football clinic. Like, she had right. a big presence there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody loved seeing. Like, she was like the Jackie O. They brought kind of class to the program. Mm -hmm. um, from a, you know, just from a perception standpoint. But from inside the program, I mean, hell, I committed. When I, when I made my commitment, it was was on the phone with Sally, was on the phone with Mac. You know what I mean? Like, I was literally talking to her. From yeah, the beginning, you're talking about you in high school. Yeah, just like, to if I committed to the of... program and I told them I committed, it was, I was on the phone with Sally. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. Sally was big. Like, Sally was, you know what I mean? She was instrumental. She would form these really great bonds with the mothers. And, it, you know, that, people don't know that. I mean, that's how, you know, they always say that if you want to win over a woman, like, you got to win over the father. You know what I mean? If you yeah. want to win over a recruit, dude, you got to get the mom. If, if, hopefully there's a mom involved. But you got to get the matriarch. There's usually of that family. a powerful female figure. You know what I mean? That's a powerful life, yeah. female figure somewhere in that in that well, young a, man's life. It's an aunt. It's a grandmother. You got to find her, and you got to vibe with her, and that's what Sally Brown was really, really good at. You know what I mean? And that was kind of the thing for me. And my hell, my mom would hang out with you know Mac Brown's mom at times during during the games. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's so they yeah. it, that, that was part of the family dynamic though. That Mac was selling. That was part of his pitch, right? Family, family, family. Well, when your wife is talking to my mom. Um, that really brings that family dynamic home. It becomes a lifestyle, not it's, just selling. Something. It wasn't just a pitch. I will say that for Mac. It wasn't just a pitch. It was. Exactly. It was legit. It was. It was the real deal. Yeah. Yeah. And Tom Herman selling the same thing. Hope I think it's the real deal too. I, yeah. It's. Uh, it's just kind of. It's kind of it's, it's refreshing, Rod, in this sense that you know, because in my formative years, I really got to see that thing be built. I was in what was I eighth grade? I think when Mac got hired yeah. freshman high school. I don't remember somewhere around there. But really got to see the thing be built from the ground up under Mac, and you see some of the same thing. Not to say that Tom Herman is a cop, carbon copy of Mac Brown because of the different guys he's worked for. Yeah, he's kind of taken different pieces from all mm -hmm. of them. He's taken some from David Bailiff and a little from Paul Rose, yeah. and a lot from Urban Meyer. That was the next thing I wanted to talk about. I don't know how I got onto it, but I went down. You guys know the dangers of going down the YouTube rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah. Don't do it. They'll just suggest more videos, and you click on that one. And they'll but this ended more. well. Yeah. Because one of the suggestions was, I guess it was the thing ESPN had done, Urban Meyer's first year at Ohio State. They did kind of a behind-the-scenes, mm -hmm. uh, almost like an all-access, hard yeah. knocks type thing of Ohio State's fall camp. And the mannerisms, the sayings, kind of the little details of an Urban Meyer coach team are some of the exact same things you heard Tom Herman talk about. Yeah. You know, and you you know when your stretch lines it's it's plus 2, it's it's fourth and inches every day. This and I'm not you know obviously you pull every coach kind of pulls yeah. stuff from and kind of form that's makes so it their you, own. Yeah, but it's it but to know the success and the number one to know the success Urban Myers had is one thing, but I think everybody that covers him can agree and that has been around him can agree that the Urban Meyer at Ohio State very different coach than the Urban Meyer who was at Florida. Mm. The Urban Meyer who was obsessed with winning. The Urban Meyer who made himself sick over losing. He's not that guy anymore. He's more devoted to family. He's, by all accounts, is a changed guy. That's the Urban Meyer Tom Herman got to work for. And I think if that Urban Meyer rubbed off on Tom Herman, you still got a great football coach. One of, you know, some people say he's 1A, 1B with Nick Saban, 1, 2, whatever. Harbaugh's in the mix as well. But – no, it, it depends. It's to each his own. Urban's, we'll Ur Urban's clearly number two behind Saban. Um, but he's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, without question. Yeah. But if if Tom Herman pulled enough from from the Urban Meyer we know at Ohio State, again, man, it's just adding on to the foundation of this program. I like where this thing is going. 
Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, the foundation of Tom Herman is you just it's undeniable. I mean, I agree with you. I'm a huge Urban Meyer fan. It's actually I I prefer Urban Meyer's um, coaching like pedigree even over Nick Saban's. To be honest, really. Um, yeah, no doubt. Urban Meyer's coaching pedigree, he fits my Belichickian theory. That's why. Um, but Urban, Urban Meyer... that's just based on career stops, what he's done to yeah, acquire his resume. Yeah, I think about how accelerated resume. his success has been. Not exactly his performance, but just what, if yeah, you like, match about, resumes, who's even more though, qualified? Even though Saban worked for Belichick. Yeah, I said pedigree, not resume. Yeah. Okay. I said pedigree. Okay. Different. Different than the resume. Okay. Resume is accomplishments. Pedigree is kind of what, what you were built, like how you were built and how where you, you were came constructed, from. Okay. where you came from. So his pedigree is what I prefer because he's had a more varied uh, approach to coaching. I think he can coach coaches better. You know what I mean? There you go. That's kind of my well thing. rounded. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's kind of my thing. Well rounded view of football. But anyway, that, we were audience. We were talking about semantics. But my uh, point is, I I agree with you though. I I think that Tom Herman has taken a lot from Urban Meyer. It's interesting because Charlie Strong was an Urban Meyer guy too. <laughs> I mean, but, but Char- we just came from that tree. But he, yeah, I agree. If you, with you talk to that. people, though, they tell you Charlie really didn't take a lot from Urban. The guy he took a lot from was Lou Holtz. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because they were side by side under Holtz. Yeah, and then at Florida, he must have taken maybe some, but in, all impression from the top from Holtz, maybe. And Charlie is more so from that. From if you really want to look at the Florida coaching tree, he's more from the Ron Zook tree than than from the Meyer, Meyer tree. tree. Yeah. Uh, I guess so. Maybe it was a personal thing, you know. At times, there was a time whenever people were thought that Charlie may get that job over, or but not saying that it was, but that would maybe lend some insight to the situation if maybe he wasn't as impressionable by Urban at the time because of certain situations. Well, how close a relationship is between a coach and his assistants definitely determines, yeah, like how influential right. they're going and to be. And holds more of a philosophy. father figure you look yeah, up to. So, yeah, so that, I, that I, all yeah, I can see that. I, I can see. see I can see just not being as well. They can, they, still, I'm doing my day damn job i'm doing my job you can do your job wherever you work and not be close to your boss like i do my job i do my job i do it well leave me the hell alone you know what i mean like (laughs) or you can be like hey man me and my boss go have drinks like three times a week you know what i mean and i think that's probably maybe what you're talking about is that urban meyer and and not they were having drinks because of me but urban meyer and tom Herman were really really close an example close to home you were on the you were on the inside uh when this was going on and I, i was getting plenty of information uh, Mac Brown and Brian Harson didn't necessarily have the best. No, they were not. They were. It was, it was so strictly a kind of professional thing. Yeah, like it really. They just. Well, you know, we coming from Greg Davis, where Mac Brown he actually hmm. did have that. Hey, we hang out and actually. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I'll see you at the house, man. My wife making dinner. She, she said, be right. there in two hours, man. Don't be late. You know what I mean? Like that kind of relationship we had with Greg Davis, guy who was in his wedding. You know what I mean? To mm-hmm. the relationship Brandy. that I got to hire this new guy. I got to reinvent the program. I just vetted him basically. So I think he's the best choice that doesn't necessarily mean that i want to go have steak i want to eat steak with him you right. know what i mean at ben shunk steak like a football assassin he just and, hired him yeah and, and and so it was and i and brian harson was coming from a different culture then because you know brian harson was coming from it's interesting he was coming from a small time coach he was coming from like a a small business like a small time business he was a small mm-hmm. law firm where everything was done kind of face to face like hey yeah. man what's up man like the boom hey man you know because boise state like we did everything face to face we were a small mom and pop kind of shop to texas at the time, which was this huge corporate, uh, you know, conglomerate at the time where even we all admit that Mac had kind of already started to distance himself a little bit from the you know program and this move to kind of save the program, reinvent the program. I think even added more distance between Mac and the coaching staff. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, because he just really, you, you got to work with, and, and Tom Harmon's big about this. And Urban Meyer actually said this. And Bill Belichick um, said this is a big part of what him and Urban Meyer agree on. This is all three things. Well, you got to work with people you like. Yeah. You got to, it, you got to, I got to like that guy. I got to like the person I'm working with. He said, I got to like the people. If I'm not, if I don't like this, so, Bill Belichick, a little fact for you smallest staff in the NFL. Smallest assistant coaching staff in the league. You want to know why? He don't like a lot of people. Right? <laughs> or I they don't, don't like, like him by the end like, of it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Now college is different, so you have to have a big staff recruiting, all that kind of stuff. But in the NFL, when you have you don't have to do recruiting stuff. He's like, no, I don't. No, I got like. 12, 15 guys I like, that's about it. I don't want a lot of people around me because I don't like a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know, and it may, they may not like me. So, you, yeah, you got to, you got to, you know, work with these people a lot, especially in football at these high, you know, high-profile programs. So, I think you got to like them. To, and that's why Tom Herman, he's big about what? 
and Tom and coaches coaches Family are big role with bringing in their guys. Yeah. I need my guys, man. Mm-hmm. I need my guys. I ain't spending time with this this dude. I don't like that dude. You I know need my guys. We we forced Mac Brown to bring in group guys that weren't his guys. That's you know what I mean? Like they weren't his guys. And Charlie was big about what going to the mat for. His guys. Yep. I want my guys, man. These are my guys. My guys. That's big in coaching right. because, honestly, they just want to work with guys they like. That's right. a lot of it. And that trust thing, Boone, you well, know that you are tied to this person, and maybe the future of your success is detached from you and dependent yeah. on somebody else, yet then you have to trust that they're going to go and implement everything that you need for you to be successful. That also shows, like, when you're talking about being friends, it's just like, yeah, everybody goes to work. Everybody wants to work. But if you're trying to be the best of the best of the best at what you do, you're probably going to have to put in a lot of extra time, extra effort, and you probably aren't going to do that if you don't like spending time around those people it just goes with one and another it's a weird it's weird man yeah and that trust factor you just brought it up that's what that's what develops out of those relationships yeah yeah to to y'all's point about you know bringing in your guys there's a couple and the kind of this conversation we're having there's a couple things i want to mention just to kind of put a bow on it um when you talk about your guys that's why i'm not big on like every time there's a coaching change and I'm guilty of it too. Mm-hmm. Get caught up in like, okay, what, can you build like this just all yes, star staff, staff of just dynamite? I'm guys. guilty of it too. Yeah. It's yeah. a the video reason, game society. It's just like, reason, oh, we can put it no, all star so like fantasy NBA. sports. The, re- yeah. the reason why we shouldn't is we've already seen that happen once at Texas. Mm-hmm. They did 2010 it. to 2011. Yeah. Mac Brown went out and got the best, the best staff coaches in the country. He could have possibly gotten. Yep. <laughs> he got the, the Cowboys hot, for 20 years. He got the hot new up and coming defense. Coordinator Manny yep. Diaz. He hired a dynamic offensive mind in Brian Harson. He got a guy in Daryl White, who was Brody. a lights out wide receivers yep. coach. Major you know, lights White out, was a lights out coach. coordinator. Major <laughs> Applewhite, one of the top <laughs> recru- top recruiters in the country. I meant to say recruiter about Daryl White. Stacy Searles, one of the top line coaches in the country, most well respected yeah. line coach in the country. Dwayne Kena, the Dwayne godfather Kena. of DBU, yeah. left and then came back. Yeah, it's true. And it didn't work. It didn't work. That's a great point, man. It really was. That was all. I remember that. That was an all-star yeah, stuff. That we was... were sure, like, man, this is a hell of a reinvention for yeah. Mac Brown, Texas football. It didn't Bo work. Bo Davis. Didn't work. Come yeah. from out from the Nick Saban tree. Come guys, from Alabama. And all those guys uh separately from the University of Texas since they've left and gone and do the other things have flourished. Well, except for Bo Davis, he got in trouble with the NCAA. Well, that's because only that's because he was crooked a little He's bit. But trying to flourish too much. All right, so aside from <laughs> impropriety off the football field, in terms of coaching, they've all done really, really well. You know what yeah. I mean? Because they were all damn good coaches for us to like, like, oh man, you know, Manny Diaz and Brad Austin, those guys are overrated and they suck, and they leave here and they all doing great. You know what I mean? Rod, like, you know uh, what you should do? It was so toxic here at the time. Right. There was nothing. That you know of help. I got this random idea. What you should do? Maybe this summer we take some vacation time. Yeah, I think you should go out to California and go see Coach Akina just to kind of get some love insight on how David Shaw is a Harbaugh guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just kind of how I want to. Stanford's one of those programs that I want to. Know. How how do they do it? Yeah, they keep talking about oh, we got academic restrictions. Yeah. No. That's Stanford. Yeah. You're talking about a whole different <laughs> with set that. of academic it's standards. Unbelievable. And you're pumping out number one draft picks, and you're yeah. winning Pac-12 championships and Heisman finalists and Rose Bowls. Yeah, I Good think point. you should do that. I think you owe it to yourself, Rod, I would, to, expand, yeah, or, to expand your football mind. They are truly unique. Well, even in there, remember when uh, Steve Patterson came to the 40 Acres? I, I'm sorry for bringing up OG Stevie P. Long one fans don't like me to do that. But even <laughs> Somebody when, just broke something. Bro. Right? OG <laughs> that, Stevie P. Broke their, uh, their, their computer screen. But, but no, even when he came in, remember, he kept talking about Stanford and their endowment. Stanford. Look at Stanford's <laughs> endowment. We want Stanford's endowment. So like, it, the, people are envious of Stanford in so many different ways. Athletically, what they can do. They, they always win. What's the cup they always win? Yeah, the one that Texas, oh man, what's the name of the East that, Chris that, Sims was on the cover of SI that, going up against them back in the day. There's June. a Texas certain award for having overall the, like sp- it, athletic, yeah. like athletic programs, ex- excellence and success. Mm-hmm. And they win it basically every year because they have so many sports. Director's Cup. Is it Director's Cup? Yes. Thank you very much. That that do so well. And they win it more than anybody because that's just Stanford. 22 consecutive years. Yeah, and then you look at <laughs> what Jim Har- Jim Harbaugh did with the football program and now what David Shaw is doing with it. I agree with you, man. Like, what the hell? How are they doing it? Like, who? <laughs> like, how do they do that? Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't, BYU was doing that for a little while, too. 
This is um, crazy. I'm looking at the Director's Cup right now. It's 22 consecutive years Stanford's won. Dude, Texas, while you were there, Rod, from 01 to 05, were runner-up three of the five years. Yeah. So, right no. there, pretty good. But uh, when you bring up Stanford and hearing when people talk about the quote unquote disadvantages that come with say you know having your different uh academic requirements yeah. it's like of course that can be a baseline that can be a little bit of an issue on the front end but then I you're know. saying That's you're true. getting the smartest <laughs> players in the world you're getting bad? Me. Yeah. are you kidding me i'm getting it's a one like, percent of the one percent give me all yeah. the smartest people in the world we talk about football iq we talk about sure this that. stuff talk about belichick great point. that's a disadvantage great y'all point. are the stupid ones for great saying point. that great you know, sorry, great, I had to great great that's, point that's one school that every year in the recruiting cycle it never fails that's the one school texas fans and i'm just using the flagship message board of horns 24 7 as a barometer the one school texas fans don't really get mad about losing a recruiting battle to a stanford yeah because if you get an offer from stanford you go you yeah. go no stanford. it's not just the offer that was solomon thomas right it's not just the offer you got to get accepted like if you guys if you guys know pay, well, I don't, yeah, pay, okay. pay attention to this in the next cycle i always tell people this and people start connecting the dots and they're like oh yeah that makes sense if Stanford has like decommitments around Christmas time, it's not that they've soured on Stanford or they want to go somewhere else. It's because they couldn't get into school. Yeah. They couldn't get admitted. Gotta so they got to go somewhere else. Yeah. It's a good point. I will say, even to, uh, to Matt's point, that if you are pursuing like um, my, your, your collegiate athletic career and trying to be a student athlete, and you are one of the elite of the elite in the uh, world of academia, and you, you know, you, are, you can qualify to get into Stanford. There is no other place that you go. Right. Right? Like, what, you want to go to Harvard and Yale? Like, yeah, the non scholarship I mean, But they don't give scholarships. And they're non-scholarships yeah, like, with, I, for athletics. Yeah, like, if you, wanna play, if you actually do want to be a college athlete and you are damn good in, um, you know, your studies and you qualify to get into an Ivy League school and you're in that rarefied air, there is no other place to go. No, there's, like, there's their rival Cal go to, or go to Duke, and then there's yeah. that second level. Down right? where it's all like you know, yeah. like hell, Texas and Wisconsin and Missouri are in that second level below them. So yeah. you, you owe yeah. that to yourself, though, Rod. Go out and check out Stanford. You need to call Coach Tina. And hell, I'll just hang there. out in Stanford. Was it Palo Alto? Palo. Hell Beautiful yeah! Beautiful. I know it is. Oh yeah, yeah you want? I forget you guys. Uh, you lost when y'all were out exactly. There, so. Yeah, too beautiful. Focus Tiger on, Woods was on the sideline, wasn't he? Tiger, Tiger, he Berkeley, was. Berkeley. young Tiger. He had hair back then. Oh man, that was the Tiger about to pre, go out. Pre uh, Tahoe and the fire hydrant, mm-hmm. Tiger Woods. Yeah, now he's Eldrick. He's not even Tiger. Anymore. We referred to him as Eldrick. But Berkeley, the same thing. I think you just get distracted with oh, beautiful all the yeah peace I, and love but now out there. The, those, and beautiful scenery. now those ales are moving to Austin. Yeah, yeah up, bringing that, that property that, value yeah. those taxes over here. I think, yeah. I, I think I told you guys this, but the best thing about that Cal trip last year was. If you're in the press box at Memorial Stadium at Cal, if you go one level up and you look out the back of the press box, it's all glass, and all you see, it's high enough up with the elevation. All you see, like, San Francisco Bay at sunset, and it's, like, the most beautiful view of anything you've ever had in your entire life. That's gorgeous. <laughs> just check the out side of the Cal press box. Nice. Kevin Durant just actually, uh, he started – the YouTube channel. I just saw him answering like 15 questions, like just sitting there on his front porch. And I thought he was in Greece. Like I thought it was from this summer. It was the nah, most man. beautiful, just back area of the bay with the sun setting behind him. It's like, yeah, I can see why you leave Oklahoma to go there. That's, that's- uh, I told my I told my wife I said that's one place we got to go back to I, we got to go together San Francisco Bay Area. You leave Oklahoma to go there. I mean, seriously, do people really get on here for leaving Oklahoma uh, to go those hang are just out? Sports fans. In, yeah, in, in Southern California, Northern California, Northern California. But seriously, California, West Coast, I should say. Mm-hmm. He was already living in Southern California in the off season. So that is true. Yeah. Um. Trying to see if we got anything else we need to uh, cover. Actually, yeah, we do. Um, I don't know. I'm just losing my stuff today. Um, I should, you know, one it's of these day. one of these days, Rod. I'm gonna I'm gonna take after you, and I'm just gonna start just writing everything down on paper instead of having tabs open and relying on it. Man, uh, yeah, I've been let down by technology too much. I don't trust it. So yeah, I just Mine write it just down. Crapped out on me. I'm having like disc errors. That's why you have ah. notes. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Don't throw them away. Apple products, I don't have that problem, sir. Oh, um, nice. Anyway, nice little product place there for Apple. <laughs> um, anyway, ESPN.com has their Big 12 post-spring position group rankings out. I got through that without stuttering all over myself. And I just want to go down and tell you where Texas is ranked in each of them, and you guys yeah. tell me 
kind of too high, too low, just right. So we'll I'll start it. And again, this isn't the specific player, it's a position group. Yeah. Quarterbacks, fifth, too high, too low, just right. Mm, about no, right. Saying, we were uh, talking maybe a little too low. We I'm, were talking like three or four. I was going to say about fourth is where I have it, but I could see him being fifth. Yeah. I think it's clear that the, the two top schools are Baker, Oklahoma, Mayfield, Oklahoma and State. Mason Rudolph. Yes. And then I think three, four, five to me are together. This is where ESPN has them ranked, which is West Virginia with Will Greer. Uh, K State, State with Jesse Ertz. Who, yeah, I mean Jesse Ertz isn't going to be an NFL prospect, a quarterback, but for what Bill Snyder wants out of he's his perfect. quarterbacks, he's oh, he's so perfect. Yeah. And then five, Shane Bouchelle, and I think Shane Bouchelle, Texas, probably would be higher. The only question you have at this point is, okay, what is this product actually going to look like with Shane Bouchelle at quarterback? Because you know Tom Herman has had mobile quarterbacks. He's had, I'll find the number here in just a second, but the number of quarterbacks he's had in terms of rushing yards. Uh, I, let me just find that real quick. But basically, he, he's always had the quarterback run game in his offense. It's best, best when he's had yeah. that. What is that going to look like with Shane Bouchelle? Um, well, this is the thing about it. That Well, it all depends on how how much he trusts a guy like Shane Bouchelle's durability. Shane Bouchelle mm-hmm. is still pretty slight. And I don't know if you want Shane Bouchelle doing a ton of running now. He did did some running last year. So I know that he can, he has functional mobility. But I think the issue comes into play because you are so depleted at quarterback because you only have two scholarships quarterbacks right now on the roster because he won't move Gerard Hurd there. Maybe you have that package of plays for Gerard Hurd, and he comes in to help you with your quarterback run game. Maybe Sam Ellinger, that's his way to contribute, is that you bring him in at times to supplement for your quarterback run game so that you don't take the chance of hurting Shane Bouchelle. I just think because you are... Man, you, you you just depleted right now. You don't have enough bodies at quarterback to go all in with the quarterback right. running game. That's the that, that's a risky proposition for a team with only yeah. two scholarship quarterbacks. Yeah, you right look now. at Bouchelle's frame. I mean, best case yeah, scenario man. is upperclassman. He could maybe become a Colt McCoy body type. Like he just has a lesser. Who, of he a also frame. got hurt a lot. As exactly. A, as a yeah. That's my point. The because yeah. of running. Yeah. Sorry, Tom, I mean, so Tom, didn't, didn't yell it, but no, I agree with you. That's why I let me agree with you. Be straight. No, you and me, we yell it when we agree. That's just normal. So Tom Herman, his career as an FBS, I didn't count his stint at, his stint at Texas State because Texas State was an FCS school at the time. But starting in 2007 at Rice. You just diss Texas State. Just really, uh, uh, cause I'm, I'm just not going to count with the FBS school. we were students there at the time. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go from 2007 at Rice all the way through to his, to his last stop as a head coach at U of H in 2016. His quarterbacks – the least amount of carries any of his quarterbacks have had at any of those stops in one season, 103 carries by Austin Arnott at Iowa State in 2010. Okay. The the minimum number of rushing yards among his starting quarterbacks, 287 by Austin Arnott in 2010. I just want to run you down the, the, the carries and the yardage for all of his starting quarterbacks. This won't take very long. 2007 at Rice, Chase Clement, 144 carries, 135 yards. 08, Clement, 154 carries, 693 yards. Iowa State in 09, Austin Arnold, 147 for 561. In 2010, he was uh, 103 for 287. 2011, Jared Barnett, 104 carries, 473 yards. 2012 at Ohio State, Braxton Miller. Shane Bouchot will not be having these kind of numbers. 227 <laughs> carries, 1,271 yards. No. Braxton Dear Miller. God, I didn't realize he ran 230 times. Yeah. And, and that was sharing <laughs> carries with Carlos Hyde, by the way. Braxton Miller in 2013, 171 carries, 1,068 yards. JT Barrett in 2014, 171 carries, 938 yards. Greg Ward in 2015, 197 carries, 1,114 yards. And then Greg Ward last year, 197 carries, 518 yards. So Tom Herman, the worst year he's had at the FBS level for any of his starting quarterbacks, 103 carries, 287 yards. So you're getting an idea of how much his quarterbacks will carry the football. Yeah. And the closest comparison in terms of body type and athleticism to Shane Bouchelle is probably going to be either Jared Barnett or Chase Clement at Rice. Mm. Yeah. When Ch- Chase Clement, wasn't he thicker? Chase Clement was a little bit thicker, so yeah, thicker. if I remember right. Yeah, no, I agree with you, but that's not, I'm just saying, you, you're, your point is there is no true comp there for right. what uh, we are about to see as to how he's going to utilize Shane Bouchelle's slight frame 
and functional mobility. Sam Ellinger is, like we said, he is built like a centaur. Like he is Rice he's listed. thick and he's made to 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 run. I've seen him run in between the damn tackles. Like he's meant to be kind of utilized that way. And he can throw the football. So and you have Gerard Hurd there who's a dual threat quarterback. Rice listed Chase Clement at six one two ten. Yeah, so he's about five eleven and a half. And so 200. what is so what is Shane? About the same. You about the same. About the same. Ah, okay. the weight probably not there. I'd say probably in that two hundred range. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. So I think this will be. Uh, we'll see the way that we see. But that was Chase being... Clement as a senior, though. Shane Bouchelle will be two ten plus. I think this. somewhere around there. That yeah. two ten. I think he. I said he's probably a two oh seven. He's got to start eating. He's like snacks, a two ten. I think. Top top end is probably a two ten to two twelve. That's just me kind of spitballing, throwing it against the wall yeah. right there. Yeah. Just guesstimating. When you look at the numbers though and what he's done in the past with the QB run game, now having a situation that we really haven't seen, a guy as diminutive as Bouchelle at quarterback, it'll be interesting to see how Herman values the situation. Does it even matter? Does he continue to run him? Does that mean that he has confidence in Ellinger? Does he change his attack? Because he understands you can learn a lot from maybe his expectations for Bouchelle, for Ellinger, and then maybe even for the entirety of offense as a whole, if he maybe abandons that usage. I think a lot of that's going to depend on the running backs, and ESPN.com ranks the Texas running back stable number seven in the Big 12 post-spring. Um, man, yeah, because the, the Big 12 has always been pretty deep in running backs for some reason. Uh, but the, I don't know if there's seven. The six, the six stables ahead of Texas, West Virginia, Baylor, TCU, hmm. K-State, Oklahoma State and Oklahoma. That's the one that I think you could toss up there. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, I need to research and I would the probably, rest of them. I would probably put Texas ahead of Oklahoma just because I mean, Texas lost- did lose Deontay Foreman, but you lost Joe Mixon and some IJP, right? Yeah, who do they have? And he must be. I don't. Need, I need yeah, to do the research. Well, I, like so a, I gotta look Chris at Chris Warren. Anymore. At least has been uh, legitimate. I don't think people so. have faith that Chris Warren is gonna stay healthy. I think there is a stigma on Chris Warren that's, that's that he, Chris Warren Agreed. is gonna go down. Let me knock on wood. We don't have a lot of wood. Or here. people just but aren't aware they, of him because they look at numbers. No, 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 no. It's I've one talked or the to other. enough. I've talked to enough people. In the industry, I've talked to enough people who, even at scouts next level, people don't have faith that big man's going to be durable. Is they he? don't have faith that he's going to last through, like Deontay did, and was able to last with that load that he carried throughout the entire season. That actually impressed a lot of people. Like, man, that guy, he can carry the load. He's an old school running back. He's not, he's a, he's a guy that, he's a workhorse instead of a, you know, kind of a show pony, which most running backs are now. So I, for a guy like Chris Warren, I, I think that's the stick. I think that's the stick that he's got to break that he can stay healthy. I can see that too. And now that you talk about a lot of the transformation of the entire wellness program and the strength and conditioning program around it, who knows what it will be going for future. Maybe it could be much improved because normally a big back is somebody that's thought to be durable. So if you aren't having hamstrings or things along those lines going wrong along the way, See if he can stay on the field, and maybe the staff may be better at doing so than previous staff. Rod, I wrote this on my scatter shooting column. I want to see what you think about this. To me, fair or not, Chris Warren is in the – granted, he hasn't had, like, the devastating – multiple devastating mm-hmm. injuries. Gotcha. He's in the Boatscape, Jordan Shipley, Jordan Hicks oh, I can see that. category yes. of – If he's point. there, great. But I don't. You can't build your run game around no, him. No, you can't. At this That's point. a great way of putting. That, I agree with that. One hundred percent. I agree with that comp. No doubt about it. That's exactly right. Just for and, the sense and, that you and can't that's a, build it and around. And that's the type of ceiling Chris Warren has of a Jordan Shipley or a Bo Scaife or those types of guys. But yeah, it would be foolhardy of you to start building your offensive identity around Chris Warren. And. Those and, situations, and, though, are ones that can really give you that high upside because if you do do that, build everything around him, and then you get him to be healthy and live up to expectations, your ceiling can just ha- get higher as a team. Well, you can build it around the run game, but you make sure you build it around depth at that running back right. position because if go. he goes down, you don't want to have to change your entire identity of your offense when that guy, that one guy goes down. It's just like, you know, go back you to 2013 I mean? real quick. We sat here and talked about it when, when Max said after the BYU game, well, DeJay gets hurt on the second play, and then it kind of threw our whole game plan in, mm. a, in a, a state of flux. 
Well, that's your fault for building the game plan around one DeJay. guy. Yeah, one guy. He should have been a compliment. Yeah, yeah. everybody is a complimentary piece. It, it builds the uh, entire puzzle. You know what I mean? That you can see it to build around one guy. It's, you know, sometimes listen. You get a, a rare when Jordan Shipley became the Jordan Shipley that we all knew. It was like, well, then it's dumb not to build around that guy. He's proven that he, you know, is worthy of that. But I don't know if Chris Warren has proven that just yet. You know what I mean? Chris, like, Chris Warren reminds me a little bit of, and I, this might be. A better comp. He reminds me of Malcolm Brown. He got hurt in spring. He reminds me of Malcolm Brown in the sense that early in Malcolm's career, he had Malcolm Brown had to shed that label of ah, I just don't know if he's durable enough. Yeah. And the last two years, Malcolm Brown was on the forty. He was. He was a workhorse. He was a workhorse. It's true. Uh, and 200 and something carries as a junior. Yeah. I don't know how many he had as a senior. And I'm not saying he can't do it. I'm right. saying that's the stigma that is out right. there, I believe, uh, about uh, him. And, f- and again, I think that's why Texas is so low, because Texas should be higher. Because his upside is Deontay Foreman type upside to me. Like, he is that, he is that, but I don't know if he's going to do that. The, thing, I don't know if he's the, thing, I, the thing I mentioned with, with Hicks, Shipley, and Boscave, all three of those guys ended up being drafted. That's after multiple catastrophic injuries. The NFL was like, Oh, that guy was a five-star prospect. I'll take him. <laughs> I mean, you I'll, spent, I'll take him. I'll take him. <laughs> with, with Shipley and Jordan Hicks, you spent top 100 picks in the draft on those guys. Those are guys that if you draft those guys, you're counting on those guys. If they're not immediate starters, they're immediate contributors. The Hicks one paid off tremendously. Get yep. a ton of investment. So did the most safe one. The Jordan Shipley one, just unfortunate. I think Jordan got into another injury once he got into the league, right? I think so, I think early on. I could yeah. be mistaken about that, but I do believe that's the case. So most of those actually end up working out in the best interest of those teams that owe the dice on those players. Because the upside was so right. huge. Yep. Texas wide receivers, according to ESPN.com, did not rank tight ends because there's not a lot of teams in the Big 12 that use a tight end. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Not the Texas tight ends would rank that highly yeah. anyway. Uh, Texas wide receiver group number four in the Big 12 behind Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, State, TCU, yeah. and Iowa State. Iowa State. Alan Lazard getting a lot Moving of Moving on up. Man. Alan Lazard's an NFL prospect. Yeah, that yeah, receiver. No, he's a good player. Um Okay, TCU, is this all because of Turpin? Cavante Turpin, yeah. Yeah, okay, most of us supposed to. See, most of this is basically kind of one guy that lifts the entire ranking, you know right. what I mean? And Texas doesn't have that one guy. Yeah. We have like 10 guys, but we don't right. have that one guy. So I, Oklahoma State, obviously, most of theirs is built around Washington, correct? You know what I mean? But right. they, they're deep, though. I do, they got like three guys. They got three guys that are really They also really got deep. Tyron Johnson, the LSU yeah. transfer, is eligible this That's year. That's right. See, so, yeah, most of that is built around having like that marquee go-to guy, and Texas does not have that go-to guy at any that, position. That's not to say that Colin Johnson can't be that guy, or Gerard Hurd can't, can't be that Devin guy, or Devin Duvernay. Yeah. They just don't run, have that guy right now. Run down the list. I man. think Texas is deeper than all – uh, I'll I Both think, of those teams ahead of it. I, I think wide we'll talk about DBs here in a minute. I think at Texas right now, I think wide receiver and safety are the two best position groups on this roster in terms of top end starting talent and depth. Oh, man. Did we, talk, did we talk about this last week? I think I disagree with you. What do you say, wide receiver? I, like, I agree with the wide receiver. Wide thing. receiver and safety. I think linebacker is really deep. I guess I'm the only person that believes that. Yeah, because, we talked briefly about it. Yeah, I guess I, I'm the only person who believes and I, that. And the reason why I like safety is because I, if you're telling me your number two safety group is John Bonney and Jason Hall, then, yeah. <laughs> your backup linebackers are like Edwin Freeman, who's a starter before. Brett, probably your number and like, two. Brick and Hager may be a backup. He was like, and let's say, you know what I mean? like, let's say, let's say it's, it stands out was at the end of spring, your number two linebacker group would be Ed Freeman. Brecken Hager <laughs> right. and Jeffrey McCullough. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, That's, to me, I don't know. I, I feel how you feel about safeties, about linebacker. I'm like, which man, an embarrassment of riches at linebacker right now. And, and you got Gary Johnson and Juco coming in. And you this is the argument you want to have as Texas fans where y'all two are arguing about which position's deeper because you actually may be getting have depth. It, haven't had that argument in a while. No. And the reason why I throw safety in there too, Rod, is because since he works out with the safeties, you got to throw P.J. Locke in there too because the Nichols work out with the safeties. Okay. They're grouped together. That's cool. Cool. Well, in that case, I, you can you can say it's deep. But then, I think listen, Malik is going to be if he performs, you know, even decent, he's going to be like a top twenty pick. Okay, so everybody's got, saying the mock drafts. You've got sources around the NFL. You got you got front office people. You talk to well, people, yeah, people. Love Malik Jefferson. What what are what do you hear from your NFL folks about Malik Jefferson? Uh, they lo- people love Malik. Jefferson. They think he's a a freak. They, they you know like he's a freak that they somehow can. 
get more out of at the NFL level than he than they have ma- been able to maximize at the college level. That and that he won't be maximized at the college level, especially in the Big Twelve. And okay. they, the Big Twelve, I'm telling you, the Big Twelve is starting to hurt guys' draft stock. It really is because of the play of the Big Twelve and the lack of physicality and the lack of. Now you're not playing up against other like you know <laughs> other first round picks like you used to back in the day. Remember that that always helps your draft stock too. Either way, he's gonna be a top pick. I, even looking at you know, the mock drafts I've seen, you know, I think, uh, was it Todd McShay? Todd McShay had him as a top 10 pick, which I thought was ridiculous. But, yeah, I don't think he's performed well as to be a top 10 pick. But it just shows you the buzz that is still around a guy when, like Malik Jefferson. Right. You're talking about and being rock, undervalued. Rock That's so big in the NFL. And you see teams like the Patriots always scooping up the value, and it sort of aligns them. When was the last time Texas had a first-round draft pick? Oh, yeah, it was a Patriot. Go Malcolm Brown there, undervalued. It's a type of thing you see across the Big 12. Yeah, uh, I saw this, though. I think that I saw that Pro Football Focus had its top. This is something that they are looking at, though, about the Big 12 that they do value. And, and Malik's going to make a lot of money. Uh, Keenan Robinson and Jordan Hicks were both top five coverage linebackers in the NFL last year, like in terms of covering tight ends, which means those guys can stay on the field mm-hmm. on passing downs. You know what I mean? You ain't got to take them off the field. One thing about Big 12 linebackers is they're, they're accustomed to playing in a passing game. They're comfortable with it. Very you true. know what I mean? Like, they don't freak out over covering the guy in the slot. You know what I mean? So it's and it, covering tight ends. And, and <laughs> usually a Big 12 linebacker is a little slimmer and a little skinnier, and he's accustomed to running. You know what I mean? I, mean, I know not, they don't have a lot of tight ends in the Big 12, but you get my point. Um, so if you look at it, I think a guy like Mick Jefferson, who – you. I think it's faster and more athletic than Keenan Robinson or Jordan Hicks. And both of those guys are really, you know, uh, good NFL linebackers right now. I think you can get a guy like Malik Jefferson. I think people are looking at him, man, I can keep this guy on the field every down. Because he can run. He can run a 4-4. Right. Four, four. That's where he's going to make his money. When Malik Jefferson goes out there and runs a 4-4, four, four, 8, 4-4, four, four, whatever he runs, he's going to run a 4-4. Four, four. And when he goes out there and runs like a 4-4 four, four something – um, and then maybe run a four five because he's putting a lot of weights. Because I think in high school he came out running a four four, which was freakish. If he does that, every NFL team is chomping at the bit. And you know we've talked a lot about, especially the NFL being a league that's been takes some time to adapt to the modern game and changes. And I mean, what you're explaining right there, Rod, if they really are undervaluing the Big Twelve and saying these guys aren't as good, maybe the market inefficiency with the NFL because yeah, you used to want to be a bigger and chunkier, more physical. You wanted to have that. That was the type of league you're playing in. But now it's just a quicker, more passing oriented league. The same way that we talked about. About the Big 12 was out in front before people ever realized it with its style. You may be able to actually have on an NFL talent that's ready to play. It's just being undervalued because it's not the physical game. I think I'll check out the undrafted free agency thing. It takes a lot of research, but I, I bet you can track that. Yeah. That since the down, since the Big 12's been down, less guys drafted, I bet they're getting more and more undrafted free agents who may be sticking exactly. more in the NFL yeah. because they're, they're cheaper and they fit more the style and the culture. Yeah, Sorry, like the spread I, babies. I got dis- sorry guys, I got distracted. Someone on a Facebook live thread said they wanted to punch me in the throat. So punch you in the throat? <laughs> yeah. Uh, why? Why did you want to punch you in the throat? I, I don't know. I just thought it was funny. It's just man. Facebook, man. It's so people social are so media violent people. You only it's hear. It's all good. I don't care. It's just. I thought it was funny. It's the loud oh, minority the throat, that you though? hear out punch there. Punch me in the throat. Exactly. Man, that's just that's, that's just rough. Violent. man. I don't know why. Yeah, punch you in the throat. Punch me in the side of the head, like I like. It could I like, actually break somebody's esophagus. I like or doing podcasts and things, so I want to keep the throat. Exactly. People are so Unless you think I'm that bad, that that's why you want to punch me in the throat and like crush my larynx or something. People are angry these days. There's a lot going on in this country. We won't good. get into it here, but people are angry for a lot of reasons. Yeah, it's so. all good. Yeah. Uh, offense, sure. Speaking of angry people, if you want to be a good offensive lineman, you should be angry. And the Texas sure. offensive line stable, according to ESPN.com, third best in the Big 12 behind Oklahoma and K-State. Yeah. Number three good ranking for the Texas offensive yeah, line? Yeah, that's good. That's all right. Yeah, Connor Williams. We talk about the go-to guys. He's the kind of the go-to guy that lifts that draft stock. I, I think you got. I think you got four you can depend on. I think it's Williams, Vahe, McMillan, and Shackelford. I think those four guys. You feel pretty good about what you yeah. got. You got to get right tackle figured out, and then part of right tackle is going to be the other thing. You don't want to put a clock on those 2016 signees, that talented group, yeah. but. You probably need one or two of those guys, in addition to Shackelford, step up and be able to give you something. Like it'd be nice, it'd be nice if Denzel Okafor won the right tackle job. It'd be nice if Patrick Hudson was basically your number six offensive lineman or your mm-hmm. number one guard off the bench, something like that, to where you can depend on guys. Jay Perkins or Gene Delance, one of those guys being able to maybe give you something if you're, I don't, you know, maybe against 
San Jose State, if it's late in the game and you're up big and you want to get Connor Williams out of there, you can stick J.P. Urquidez in at, at left tackle and let him get some work in, something like that. But it, you got to start developing some depth. I know Elijah Rodriguez is a guy that they're going to move multiple places to try mm-hmm. to manufacture some depth. I, I'd be interested to see if Shackelford is going to get some reps at guard in fall camp, maybe to to, to see if you can manufacture some more position yeah. depth. So. Uh, just doing some different things like that, but I think three is a pretty good spot for the. Yeah, uh, for we're the talking Texas about offensive line draft stuff. I want to say was it Matt Miller who is the uh, NFL draft scout for Bleacher, Bleacher Report. Report? Yeah, he said that he would be shocked if Connor Williams was the number one overall pick. Like that's how high he is. In the <sighs> that's awesome. bold, man. That's I know, bold. no, no. I'm not saying that's gonna happen. Right. But I'm just saying like that's how high he is. Well, I mean, him. if you're the top tackle prospect in theory, that's could yeah. be the case in a year. And that's kind so, of that's there. You I, are. I think that's where he's going. And he's the top tackle prospect. I, I guess it, Texas fans, if you're not prepared for Connor Williams to not be here beyond 2017, you know, get your head wrapped around it now. He's definitely going to leave. Well, because everybody says he's a first rounder, but now people are saying like he's top 10, like top 15. I definitely think he's, yeah, he's, he's got to go. That's, that's the right decision for himself. For all the talk, let's talk about the offensive line's counterparts. For all the talk we heard about defensive linemen are too big, they need to lose weight, blah, blah, blah. ESPN.com ranks the Texas defensive line as the number one Numero defensive uno. line in the Big 12 coming Good. out of spring. Man, like that's that. awesome. I, I'm gonna, Pulling forward, I'm going to give Tom Herman the benefit of the doubt until I, ha- I no longer have a reason to. If he says he can go win games with the first three he's got, Puna Ford, Chris Nelson, Malcolm Roach, then I believe him that he can go win with the first three he's got. Now – what will determine whether this group is the number one group in the Big 12 by the end of the season, which if they are, then we'll know Texas had a pretty good year. It's going to depend on what you get from Charles Amenahu and Jordan Elliott and DeAndre Christmas and Gerald Wilbon and those guys. Yeah, I agree with that. But How that younger group, and I, I don't know if you could put Amenahu in that younger group. I don't think I you can. Amenahu should have higher expectations. But, you know, if you can get something, because D line's one of those positions where you've got to have depth, you've got to have a rotation, especially in the Big Twelve. You can't have three or four guys playing eighty five, ninety percent of they'll your be, snaps. They'll be done in the third, mid third quarter. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. You Which got, we've seen, we've seen the last yeah, few years. You got to have, have you got to have seven guys uh, in your D line. You can rotate and, and keep the bodies fresh. You yeah. know what I mean. Um, so I agree with you. I think the front line guys. I'm really excited about Malcolm Roach. Like I think Malcolm Roach is. Gonna be special, like really special. Um, from what I hear, Puna Ford is a Tom Herman favorite, so you know he's already earned those stripes. Tom Herman would not compliment you if you had not already earned that. He right. is not that type. He's a, he likes to burst bubbles. He doesn't like to uh, you know blow you know sugar on guys' backs, as Mac Brown used to say. <laughs> um, and yeah, Chris Nelson, I think, is a pleasant surprise actually that Chris Nelson has come on. As, yeah. as that third guy, because I, I mean, we weren't sure who that other person would be that was solidified that spot. So I, I like that he's got a lot of veteran experience. You know, Charles Amenu. So I like that's a veteran line now, and that I got, I got, you got one guy who I think is make, who is a penetrator who makes plays in the backfield, and that's Malcolm Roach. Rod, you, uh, you like the Texas linebackers? I love them. So does the Big Twelve. So does ESPN.com. ESPN.com ranks the Texas linebacker group at number two. Behind only TCU. Doesn't K State have a good group coming back? Am I, is K State? <laughs> hey, we don't even have to. K State's K State's K-State 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 are ranked eighth. Okay, so maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, By the okay. end of the year, they'll be ranked third because right. they're always better than expected. <laughs> Yet you don't have any expectations for them on the front end. It's K State. You just don't think about it. I think te- the Texas linebacking core is, is an uber talented group. It really, really is. I think on talent alone, it's more talented than who's ranked ahead of them? TCU. TCU. I think it's more talented than TCU. TCU's school. got some experience. Traven Howard, Ty yeah. Summers. They That's got like more the Gary names. Patterson guys treatment. Guys like he yeah. always has good linebackers. Exactly. But I think this group is the most talented linebacking group in the in, in, sorry, in the Big 12. And then uh, finally, Rod, we end with DBs. Uh, Case, oh, Case State has the number one DB group in the Big 12, according to ESPN.com. Texas comes in at number four. I'm shocked that they're that high, actually. Really? Yeah. So we're we're just on different. Le- I'm not that high on the linebackers. You're not that high on on this. Well, why should the, we should be high on the, the secondary? Because the safeties has depth now. I say two safe two, two starting safeties now. Deshaun Elliott and Brandon Jones are awesome. And I think and you've great. upgraded big time. You right have, there with but both that's that is based on like projections mostly. Now uh, on a small set, very small set. And I, I would argue to an extent, linebacker is too. 
Um, yeah, but I got a guy that mock drafts are saying is going to be drafted in the top 15. I got you ain't you. got nobody that's going to, that right now is dr- mocked to be drafted anywhere. What knocks and the, those guys don't even use DBU anymore. What knocks the DB <laughs> group down? Because again, I'll throw PJ Locke in there with the safety group. So g- give me PJ Locke, Brandon Jones, and Deshaun Elliott. I think that's three guys. You, you have a three guys you can go win with. I think I'm a three big guys PJ you can Locke fan. PJ Locke and then you, you, you talk about, uh, Jason Hall and John Bonney behind them. I think that's that's two good veteran guys Solid. that have been through the battles. Yeah, Agreed. I like that. What knocks Texas down the pecking order at in the secondary is cornerback in terms of what kind of a bounce back year are those young corners? They're not young anymore, but that trio of Holton Hill, Chris Boyd, and Devontae Davis, Agreed. specifically Hill and Davis trying to bounce back from just forget them. They were both forgettable last year. Just, mm-hmm. You didn't hardly see them. They weren't hardly on the field. Just basically their sophomore years were a wash, both of them. Yeah. Can they bounce back? And you have no cornerback depth right now. Really, you don't. I mean, Eric yeah. Cuffey's a redshirt freshman. Donovan DuVernay's a redshirt freshman. But Tom Herman said coming out of spring, one of his biggest concerns was cornerback depth. And yeah. outside of those first three I mentioned, I don't think you really have any. I mean, if you're one of those incoming freshmen, Josh Thompson or Kobe Boyce, there might be a spot in the two deep you can go win in fall camp. Yeah. And that, yeah, I mean that. I I agree. That's I guess that's more what I'm looking at too. I don't. The corners have been been disappointing. Trust me, I don't right. want to say that, but been right. very disappointing because I talked them up too. I w- I would expect you Rod to grade a, a Texas defensive back unit harder this than is most. Very true. Good point. I'm probably a little yeah. Not that I'm saying you're being harsh on these guys, no, but I'm, you're going to look at I'm that probably, position, yeah. position specifically with a more critical eye. This is true. I've been hard on the young corners, but they they, they deserved it last been, year, though. Yeah, it's been a disappointment last to say year the was least. Bad. It's well, been, you know what to look for. It's been more than a sophomore slump. So, Rod, were you writing all that down? Yeah, kind of where the position groups are. Yeah, I got the cornerbacks. I mean, the secondary is fourth, right? Secondary. Fourth. Yeah. Yeah. So, looking at all that. Where do you, where do you think this team should project in terms? Because it's getting to be around time where we're about to get uh, you and I both will get our preseason mm-hmm. media ballots for Big Twelve Media Days. That's right. Um, where would you slot this Texas team if you were doing a preseason poll right now? Just basically, it, the ESPN, question. the ESPN position rankings are it's only one metric, and you can use whatever. There's no like right or wrong answer to filling out your media ballot for Big Twelve Media Days to come it. up with the preseason That's poll. Good. Oh, where'd you rank? Where would you right slot now? Texas? Right now, I'm going to slot Texas at, oh, fourth? Maybe I'll go fourth in the Big 12. I'd go fourth. Now, I know Oklahoma and Oklahoma State are better teams. But right now, I don't know who the third team is that's better than Texas. I would put K State over Texas. I know it's gonna be. I know it's somebody is. I just don't know who it is. I would. I would go K State over. I would there you go. go. K-State that's over a safe. Texas. There you go. You know, what I mean, they got a lot of veteran experience. Yes, yeah, so I'm with you there. I, I, and I don't know who it's gonna be that's better than Texas, but somebody's gonna fill in that third slot to be better than Texas. Texas got a brutal schedule actually, mm-hmm. and we talked about that stretch. And I think that stretch is gonna hurt them, and somebody's gonna slip in there above them. And the reason why I put K-State in there is talking to some K-State people. K-State felt like last year was going to be a year where they experienced some growing pains and maybe maybe they were a 6-7-5 yeah, type for a team. Snyder team. They ended up being pretty good. I know. Um, they felt like this was the year that they could be That's scary. maybe a dark horse contender for the conference championship. And K-State's one of those teams you'll feel every year like Bill Snyder will make you think he's got the worst team in the conference. But – I'm always look up. I always look, yeah. but I always look at K State differently. When the internal expectations are, hey, we think we might have something here. That my antennas go up because to me that means something. When <laughs> yeah. internally, when they're talking about they might be really good, I'll go ahead and and put K State pretty high up in the pecking order. I agree with you on that. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a sound rationale. I'll give you that. Yes, I had not heard that K State that confident about themselves that day. Not to say they think they're going to win the Big shock 12. But anybody, right. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. It's K State. What do yep. you know about K State? Nothing. But no, that makes sense. <laughs> blah blah blah. Snyder cliche. Blah blah blah. Exactly. Play hard, uh, Manhattan. Yeah. All right, uh, I think that's uh, I think that's going to wrap it up, gentlemen. Another edition of the Blitz. Mm-mm. Is in the books. Travis is not on mic, but Travis, thank you so much for being the best damn videographer in the Travis podcast. Is the man. Matt, thanks for everything, sir. Oh, you are more than welcome. Rob B, appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother. Anytime. For Matt, for Rod, for everybody at AM1300 The Zone, am1300thezone.com, where you can hear this podcast each and every week. And thanks to Matt, you can get us on iTunes, tune in, SoundCloud, and any podcast app. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Zone family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I'm Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode.
and I'm going to try to keep it together. I, I don't know that I can or will, so I make no promises. Um, yeah, this is harder to do than I thought. Uh, this episode of Longhorn Blitz will be the, the last Longhorn Blitz. And this, uh, this was a decision that was not uh, the three of us. It was not any of our doing. Mm-mm. It was something that was out of our control. Um, but we met last week and decided that um, we've had a hell of a run doing this show. And uh, I think the three of us are in a position now professionally much better. And I, I can't think I can speak for you guys. I say personally mm-hmm. much better than when we started this venture. And I think the three of us are prepared to kind of go off on our own paths. I'll let you, I'll open it up to you guys in just a second, but I just want to say a few things before um, we sign off here for the last time on the blitz. I, I, I will do a podcast somewhere. Shape Rod mm-hmm. still got his radio show. Matt still got stuff he's going to do. Yeah. Um, I will do um, a podcast of some sort. I don't know what, I don't know with who, I don't know. It might be by myself. I have no idea. <laughs> um, I, I will have these guys on. Uh, these guys are people I consider friends. And uh, the, you not consider you guys are friends. Yeah, I don't know why I said that, but <laughs> well, um, you consider too. Anyway, um, when I just kind of want to walk you guys through just some rationale. When when I I I, uh, I started, and by the way, this is my last day in the iHeart building. I just realized that on the drive over here. Hmm. So um, yeah. uh, I was thinking back to the first time I was in this building. Uh, it was 2010. Jerry Hamilton and I had a meeting with John Madani. And John wanted a Texas site that he could trust that was reputable um, to basically be kind of the recruiting arm of the zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, he reached out to Jerry. Jerry and I were all for it. And uh, because I live in Austin, uh, it was going to be kind of my thing to kind of be the the go between the the guy that different shows uh, leaned on for recruiting information and to come on and talk team and whatnot. And, uh, I will forever be thankful to John Madani for mm. giving me that opportunity. Good man. Um, great man. Can't say enough good things about John Madani. And, uh, you know, for me, this is going to be the hard part. For me, being a kid from Florence, Texas, who wasn't supposed to get out, and I'm not supposed to be here, mm. um, I used to listen. I used to, you know, whenever I could in high school, I would go listen to the station in the car. Um, community college, I would cut classes to listen to this show, uh, which, by the way, kids, I don't advise you cutting classes. <laughs> don't do it. Hey, um, hey, that show's good foresight. You knew that profession. You were focusing. But, I, <laughs> but I, would, I would listen to Bucky Godbolt on the air, and I would listen to Craig Way on the air. And the fact that um, I went from imagining what it would be like to be in a studio, to be with guys like that, to be able to, because of John Madani and the agreement we had, to be able to do radio with Craig Way, to be able to do radio with Bucky Godbolt, mm-hmm. to be able to call those guys mentors and coworkers. Um, that is that is why I uh, I'm leaving this venture with no regrets, no animosity towards anybody. Um, I've done stuff in this radio industry if you want to call it that that i never thought i was going to be able to do i've done radio with ricky williams i've done Hmm. podcasts with mark henry um again for a kid coming from florence america i was that was not supposed to happen to me um and uh one of the reasons why i stuck with it so long i guess i can let the cat out of the bag now um i never got paid a dime for doing this podcast (laughs) um never got paid a dime by iheart the only compensation i ever got from clear channel slash iheart was uh Madani was actually, when he was getting ready to leave, he was cleaning out his office and I went in there to talk to him about something. And he had some Houston Texans mini helmets on his, <laughs> on his desk. And, uh, <laughs> he let me leave his office with an Andre Johnson autographed mini helmet that, Boom. that and the, the, the occasional Rudy's barbecue gift card Rod would slide me <laughs> yeah. for picking up some a shit. Tacos maybe yeah. if you came in for the morning yeah, show. Yeah, I would get some tacos <laughs> or whatever. So I got paid, you pay me in food and Paid-ed autographs tacos, and I'm good. Man. Um, <laughs> but uh no nah, the, the reason why i stuck with it though uh when my dad was still alive um the, the the this was coming from my mom the greatest joy he had was sitting by the radio listening to me do pregame or listening to a podcast and that's what kept me going and kept this venture um whatever was going on whatever i was feeling the the ability to come in this studio for the hour and a half or two hours or however long we were in here um, 
you forget everything, whatever's going on. And it's mm-hmm. just really, we had no scripts. We had no formats. <laughs> it's three guys shooting the breeze. And that's the Pretty way much. I wanted. That's the way I wanted the show to be. And, mm-hmm. and I hope that's how it came off. Um, I know I've gotten emails and, and, and things over the years. We've been doing this for five years now. I know. It's a and, long time. And, long you know, time. people that tell me, hey, uh, you know, I'm a cancer survivor and listen to the blitz just kind of helps me forget about that. Or, you know, if you've had, the, had guys have had a rough patch in their life and saying that, hey, you know, I listen to blitz for an hour, hour and a half a week. And that kind of helps me forget about everything. That means more to me than you guys will ever know. Those of you who sent those emails and those texts and those Facebook messages. Um, I, I joked on this episode about some guy who said he wanted to punch me in the throat. That's fine. I don't I don't care about this stuff. If I cared about this stuff, I would have been out of this industry a long time ago. Yeah, and I wasn't uh, timely with it, but basically he wanted to give you. If you down on your knees while I hit you in your throat and knock your windpipe out. Then it collapse your windpipe. The windpipe chop. Oh. Uh, so that kind of gives you guys a background as far as how this podcast came together and i'll turn it over to matt and rod and let them kind of close us out um matt and i i I wanted to do a podcast i didn't know how to do a podcast still really don't know if i could do a podcast (laughs) but uh matt and i kind of started just doing something on the side and we decided to bring rod in for uh just a couple guest spots and it turned out that rod's guest spot for a couple shows turned into five years yeah um, guess that wouldn't leave man so <laughs> it, we just decided to make kind of make this our own little project um when you think back to some of the highlights of the shows matt just played one rod or actually that was from rod's radio show but we had a great deal of fun laughing oh, about man. the windpipe chop there was the time that matt suggested that <laughs> uh if caleb blew it and Hassan ridgeway could service people on the field that they would be <laughs> more effective defensive lineman. Uh, there was the rant I had after the 2012 Kansas game oh, that's great. where Brian Harson couldn't decide whether to get Marquis good on the ball because the ball wasn't on the right, right hash, hash mark. mark. Yeah. Um, we've had coaching changes and Mac getting fired and Charlie getting hired and Charlie getting fired and Tom Herman getting hired. Three coaching changes. What yeah, you? we've been through three head coaches on this podcast. Yeah. Um, hmm. But again, I, I just want you guys to know out there, you guys that are fans of the show, I I'll forever be indebted to you guys that followed this show and enjoyed this show. Um, I, I kind of took this idea from Rod in that on uh, Rod show, the sports buffet, the sports buffet, as I know it was Rod, <laughs> Cedric Golden and AJ Hoffman. Yeah. That to me is the sports buffet. Yeah. And that is no disrespect to Keith Moreland or Craig yeah. way or anybody else or Chris Duell or anybody else has been with Rod since. Yeah. But, Whatever I do next will not be called Longhorn Blitz. Longhorn Blitz will be retired, or if the three of us get together yeah. for a show, we will bring back Longhorn Blitz bring because the three of us is Longhorn Blitz. There will not I will, I do not want to tarnish that name or or bastardize that name or do anything to that name because I'm hmm. proud of what we did here. Um, it's been a hell of a run. I've enjoyed my time uh, getting to work with you, Rod. Um, you're somebody I can call a friend now, and no I'm, doubt, I'm bro. thankful for that. Um, thankful for the opportunity again from John Madani, from Craig Way, from you, from Bucky Godbolt, everybody that kind of opened the doors here at Clear Channel slash iHeart to let me just come in here and, and do my thing. Uh, and thankful to Matt because I, I I know I say this every week, um, and I'm not joking when I say it. If it was not for Matt, the show would be awful. Yeah, it'd be a terrible. It, it would show. be terrible. It would. Um, it would so I, I will probably close it out with some more thoughts. But Matt Rod, if you guys want to say anything um, before we close it out, I'll turn it over to you guys. Yeah, no, I'll take from right there. I mean, first off, thanks for always giving the compliment, even though not necessarily as deserved as y'all would say, because y'all too are just as deserving or more so of making the show in what it was. But it would have never got to this point if y'all too had not been my friend back whenever I was at the sports buffet. And this was all birthed hmm. from me just showing up one day to work and being fired and not knowing what I was going to yeah. do with my life. Yeah. And literally There's a theme here about iHeart and what they have done to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, who's next? <laughs> but yeah, so uh, when you look at it that way, I mean, at the time it was a crossroads. I had given all my life to being in sports radio and then like mm. show up, don't have it. But I mean, within before I mm. even got home that day, I had a phone call from Rod. I had a phone call from Craig Way. I had a phone call from Jeff that afternoon, all talking because we form relationships that, yeah, the job's a vehicle that maybe brought us together, but then can also be one that sends us in different directions, yet the people are the reason why that we continue. And that's why Jeff said there that he wanted it to be conversational. We never came at this as some, you know, radio show all professional and trying to golf. We wanted to sit here like dudes talking how we actually hmm. would talk to right. one another and enjoy ourselves because 
we actually we have mutual respect. We all know that we come in here prepared, but we also we come from very different backgrounds, so we can give good perspective. And we I uh, we were a good melting pot of what Austin is an Austinite, a country kid, a black guy from Houston. You know, like <laughs> it's everything that is this when you look at yeah. the city of Austin in the city. So I can't thank y'all two the most for wanting to allow me the opportunity to even continue to work with y'all because it kept me in a space that opened up doors for me. So I can, I'm even more thankful for it. And like yeah. you said, Jeff, we're all friends. And I bet yeah. this won't be the last time that some version of Longhorn Blitz is reunited. And you know, me and Rod chatted a little bit from side to side about mm -hmm. future stuff. And we may be you know, uploading a butt rod to the feed and stuff like that so our fans can know, still get us at the same spot if we're doing stuff the way we used to do butt rod along with Longhorn mm -hmm. Blitz. But Longhorn Blitz blitz as we know longhorn blitz is us three and it will be dead after today yeah um that man I, I i got into this industry and approached it the same way like i did football and i just wanted to like really do a damn good job like every day you know what i mean like in everything you do and i want to work with people that had pride in what they in what they did and really were to a certain extent a lot of guys who were kind of living their dream this is your dream yeah like I and I love that's why I love working with Craig Way. Like that was Craig Way Craig Way is living his dream. Like that Craig Way's dream is to be the play by play voice of the Texas Longhorns. He is the play by play voice of the Texas Longhorns. Cause when you work with people that are living their dream, they have this this light, this energy. And even when life is whooping their ass, which it often does, <laughs> yep. Jeff will walk in here, I'll walk in here, or Matt will walk in here, I'll be like, Oh, I can tell why life is whooping his ass right now. You know what I mean? But nope. Microphone clicked on, let's go. Give it everything I got. Because mm -hmm. I do understand that there are people out there who are not living their dream. And they go to work every day. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, and we get a chance to do this and actually and, and and you know, obviously you didn't get paid for this. But part of what makes you special to the podcast, what made you special to the podcast, because you were living your dream and your dream was to cover Texas football and to do it for an organization that is respectable and one that uh, that obviously has a a certain level of credibility. You know what I mean? Right. And that's what you did with And I remember when Horn Super 7 wasn't what it is today. Right? Yeah. That's how it all just kind of started. You know what we I mean? We started from scratch. Yeah. And then Horn Super 7, and just a really, I mean, I don't know how it works with, you know, looking at, you know, stock uh, prices and where you guys came from in terms of what the value of the company. But man, it seemed like it happened almost overnight. Where now, you know, not only Horn Super 7, but 247 Sports, it's all big and it's a big conglomerate. You know what I mean? Yeah. You were a big part of that. You know what I mean? Because you were there on the ground floor. And, you know, you starting out with the sports buffet relationship, I think. You know, it all helped us grow, and we all kind of grew. And not that we've outgrown this at all, but as you pointed out, everybody's ready to go their own separate paths, also living their dream to a certain extent. Right. You know, and I got the show too. You know, I've been working with Matt forever, and and the reason I'll continue to to work with Matt and I'll continue to work with you, just like I said, I like working with people that are kind of living their dream. Matt was the same way. You know what I mean? And he had passion for it. I got passion for what I do. I really do try to put the best damn show together every day that I can. I put hours of work into it. You know what I mean? And I just, because I have pride. Hell, man, when I was working at Academy of Sports and Outdoors, I had pride selling shoes. I had pride stacking boxes and UPS. So I know no matter what I do these days, hell, I could end up working at Goodwill. I have no idea. But I have pride in it. You know what I mean? And that's kind of my lesson to anybody. And I like, talk to kids. I like, have pride in what you do. Man, don't, 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 have, don't put your name on something that ain't good. Right. And I was going to put my name on this because I was sure that you guys were going to approach it with the same pride that I did. That's why I love working with Matt. Because I, when, when Matt br comes to the table, he brings it every damn time. The same thing, I like to play with guys who are going to bring it. If you're going to be, you know, if you're going to be pussyfooting around and you weren't going to give it your all, then I don't want you playing next to me. And I'll tell my coach, too, that I, I want to play with guys and I want to work with guys the same way who give it everything they got. So that's why I appreciate you guys. That's why I, I love doing the podcast. Like, it was one of, I used to always get compliments. People always going to tell me, oh, man, I love the Blitz. Blitz is awesome, man. You guys are great. And honestly, I got, I got as many, if not more, compliments from people on the Blitz than I've done from the show. I don't know what that says about the show, but that's just how much people love the Blitz. And I love the Longhorns, and I, you know, I bleed orange. That's just the way I am. And... You know, I, that was a certain uh, catharsis. There was a certain therapeutic uh, element to the show for me 
coming in here to talk Texas football. Because I can't just talk it every day right. on the show. People get annoyed. Oh, man, Texas home. You're talking Texas football. I mean, I'm syndicated in San Antonio and also I can't talk Texas football all the time. People get tired of that. I, I love being able to just come here and just talk Texas sports, Texas football. It was great. And I'll find some way to do it. And we'll find some way to work together again. But I want to let you guys know it's truly been a pleasure. I think you guys are great. I think you, all you guys are going to be a success. And if I remember big enough to, you know, uh, pay people whatever the hell I want to because some company is going to pay me a ton of money and say, you bring in the guys you want to work with, man, I'd bring in all of y'all, Travis included, because I know you guys take pride in your work. And that goes back to our Tom Herman conversation. You know what I mean, people you trust, yeah. people you know are going to wreck shop because they take pride in what they do. Yeah. And that's, I'm, I'll probably never get there where I can do that. But it, I, if I could, I'd bring you guys in. I, I, that's how much I really do think of you guys. To, to kind of wrap it up, uh, you talked about living the dream. And again, I'll just reiterate, that's that's what this was for me. The, 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 the idea of like, I've known what I've wanted to do since I was like in the second or third grade. Like it's not why well, I realized at a pretty early age, look, the, the per, playing sports probably ain't going to work out long term. Mm. So I need to figure out another Avenue to enjoy it. And this is the Avenue. And like I said, I used to listen to station. I used to listen to this. It wasn't any station. It was this station. Mm. Um, I used to read publications like the one I work for now. Yeah. Um, and I'm living the dream and look, I'm, I'm not any more special than anybody out there. I'm not privileged. I'm not, um, I, I didn't, there wasn't anybody I paid to get this. It wasn't some, you know, nobody handed this to me. Um, it is, it is truly by the grace of God that I've gotten into this position that I'm in right now. And, uh, for you guys to, to have been, to, you know, for you guys to come into my life when you did, um, and to be friends, um, I can't say enough good things about you two guys. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, it will probably not be to the, I, I can almost guarantee it won't be to the extent of this podcast. Uh, I, I see the three of us working together at some point, mm. some way, shape or form doing something, even if it's a one-time deal or just side projects here and there. Um, I see it working out, but I think, uh, Matt, can we get some Dr. Dre to play us off? <laughs> um, kidding. Fitting. I, uh, for, hold on. Yes. Before we do that, before we do that, and Rod, I know you got a show to do. We got to get out of here. Can the last piece of audio that we hear on this show, can it please be the Bill Little, Paul Splitorf audio? Oh, can well done. Can that be the one last piece of audio? Oh, well done. Actually, I have not heard this in probably like a year. We haven't played this on the show in forever. Yes, no, that is an amazing oh, okay. piece of well, audio, no, no. and I'm pulling it up right now. I actually had it in my email, okay. but it's still in here in the, oh. the system, and I'll give a little bit of prefacing. It was a Big 12 yeah. tournament in 2011, and Texas happened to be <laughs> playing up in Missouri, and just because of the situation, there was some news, and it was Bill Little, you know, and Bill Little being an old man, he must have known who this former old man Paul Splitorf was because he was a announcer and he had maybe played a little bit of basketball but either way he also have to like get a whole story in whenever you're playing call and do them play by play and there's like eight seconds between pitches and just really probably wasn't able to fit it all in as succinctly as he would prefer quickly down on the count nothing in two Craig it doesn't have anything to do with Missouri but it was in fact a, a Kansas City, and that uh, I need to mention Paul Splitorf, one of the greats in baseball and one of the fine people we ever met in the announcing business. He's dead. 0 2 pitch, and here's a fly ball out toward right. So, also a pretty doggone good basketball analyst because he played basketball as well and worked on the Big 12 Network. Yes. He did, and, and I first met him in Omaha in 19. Well, actually, he did a game in Austin. In, in the, 1980s. He was a color man right after he finished his pro career, and there was not a nicer guy in the business. Cancer. <laughs> Cancer. Pitch, Mark Payton misses for ball. You got to get it in three. before the pitch. Quit <laughs> referencing about the stuff you don't know. And oh my God, here comes a pitch. Cancer. Oh my God. Yes, he's dead. Pink. I love the. He's dead. And you know, nothing in the count. Oh and two. Quickly down on the count. Nothing in two. Oh. Man, he's dead. Matt. Oh, my goodness. My friend, thank you God, for everything. That's you are more than welcome. To end, David. Well done. <laughs> Rod B, I oh, sincerely man. appreciate the time and the knowledge, man. It's, it's been great, brother. It's been great, man. Love you guys. For man. Matt, for Rod, for John Madani, oh, for Craig great. Way, for Bucky Godbolt, for everybody at AM 1300 The Zone, for the guests we've had on the show, Tim Crowder, Casey Stutter, oh, Jamal man. Charles, Earl Thomas, Lamar Houston, 
Mark Henry. I know I'm leaving people out, but thank you so much. Anybody that contributed to the show. For everybody at AM1300 The Zone, am1300thezone.com, where you can, I'm sure, get archives of this show each and every week for however long you want to. That's true. Until and the Blitz will never here. truly be dead because <laughs> thanks to Matt, you get us on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and any podcast app. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Zone family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I am Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. Mention Paul Splitarf, one of the greats in baseball and one of the fine people we ever met in the announcing business is dead. 0-2 oh, nice pitch, and here's a fly ball cancer. out toward right. That guy in the business, cancer. First pitch to Mark. There was not a nicer guy in the business, cancer.